Hello and welcome to RPG Research. This is our Thursday weekly applied gaming session, and uh, we um, are a little short-handed today. We've had Nine quite a few people. <laughs> Let's not have that conversation, please. <laughs> Um, we uh, had quite a few people who are sick and unable to make it to today's session, including the Game Master who was going to be doing his baseline. Uh, he, he, so what we do when we have new Game Masters come on board... Oh, i got to turn on that microphone. And record. Uh, I am recording, and I, it, it, it is partially recording, but now we got the front microphone here. Um, so each Game Master, the trainee comes on board, we get a baseline of where they're at, and then go from there. And uh, so Shane was going to get his baseline today, but he is under the weather. He might do it Saturday. We'll see if he's feeling well enough then. So, uh, and then meanwhile, Dan in Brazil, Spokane Dan, and Danielle, so all three of the Dans, <laughs> couldn't make it. What is it with people named Dan who can't make it? <laughs> it's a cursed name. <laughs> uh, so none of them were able to make it today, but thankfully Riley's here and John is here. Thank goodness Riley is here because otherwise we wouldn't even have enough to even kind of play. We we could do solo. It would turn into an extended well, we show. we could grab one of the one on one adventures. There's a couple of uh, expert level solo. X solo is one on one. It's meant for one GM and one player. Did you know that? Well, those in Beck me. Yeah, there's a couple of them that are specifically meant for one GM and one player, not solo, but one one on one. And then there's the solo ones as well. I've been forced to occasionally turn a module into a one-in-one. -one. Sure. Oh, yeah. I've got, well, my, my youngest son really likes doing those because they can be really in-depth. Uh, so in our talk show, we, we did do a quick run-through of some recent goodies that we got for evaluation. If you didn't catch it, we're going to go through it briefly again. If you want more detail, you'll have to uh, check out the uh, RPG talk show episode from today, February 7th, 2019. These lights are blasting out. So, um, for, for more detailed discussion, but we'll just go through them quickly, and then we'll have to pick one. I think we'll actually play one of these games tonight. So, uh, one of the things that came in, it's not a game, but it's a comic book, but it's related to Zombie Orpheus Entertainment, the Gamers, uh, specifically Gamers 3, and this is the Counter May comic book, so this is from Patreon supporters and such. Counter May, War of the God King, Episode 1. Vansel, Arnold, Foster, and Poorman. And uh, that is going out to Patreon supporters, and I think you can buy them as well. So that's a little comic book for the shared universe that the gamers' uh, universe multiverse is in. And it's how the American soldiers ended up being sucked into the fantasy setting, uh, oh. thanks to nuclear testing back in 1940-whatever, two or four. Probably. Oh, yeah. um, where did the war just started? So, forty-four. Yeah. Well, there was testing, and then there was dropping the actual bomb. But yeah, probably forty-four. Uh, also, we got in recently because I, I, we were talking, we were complaining about how there wasn't a currently published Star Trek role-playing game. Well, we were mistaken. Since twenty seventeen, there is Starfleet. Sorry, Star Trek Adventures by Modifius Entertainment. That's Modifius.com. M-O-D-I-P-H-I-U-S.com. Did you text your wife? Yes. Okay. And uh, it uses a 2D20 system, and it is set in the time period overlapping uh, near the end of Star Trek Next Generation, good middle to middle part of Deep Space Nine and early part of Voyager, when all three of those seasons were running. It's all those events around that time period. Uh, really, there was a lot going on uh, during that time. So... This is right around that time when there's a lot to pick from in multiple quadrants. It covers multiple quadrants. It's a good, heavy book. There's a lot of material in here. Now, I already have practically you know half a shelf of Star Trek role-playing games all the way back to FASA onward through the other uh, editions. But this is one I'm not familiar with at all. And I only bought the core rule book. You know, there's other supplements and such. But it claims this is enough to get started. So at some point... Now, this doesn't have a quick start, 
So I'll need time to read and learn, and or somebody to read and learn, and then make character sheets and right. play it. No. No, 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 no. We, we don't want. He, remember, he, he wants to focus on playing, so we don't want to overload him. Also, I'm happy I, that he did I, paranoia. No, no prior knowledge of Star Trek at all. So okay, yeah, we don't know the setting at all, and that would be rough. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a big Trekkie Trekker type, it's but I, Star Wars with I've watched science. all of them. Well, it, it, but it's different. <laughs> but it is different. Star Trek is. I just have no knowledge of what's in it. Yeah. Right. That's okay. And Star Wars tends to be more action oriented than Star Trek. Yeah. It's space mm -hmm. opera. Yeah. <laughs> Babylon Five, epic space opera. That's my favorite. <laughs> By far my favorite. And that's the one I know really well. I, yeah, my favorite. By far. You've never played it. I haven't played it. I, I've, I've watched yeah. every Babylon 5 episode. Well, and there's three different systems to play it in. You can play the original Babylon Project system, which is its own distinctive system, which actually I borrowed some of the combat to hit stuff from for my D20 adaptation mm -hmm. for crits. And then they have the D20 versions, 1 and 2, you know, so it was 3.x modern. And so they had the Raider D20 and then the second edition D20. So that's where it turns blue books there. That's right. the second edition. So all of those there are, are Babylon 5. And then it went to Traveler, Mongoose Publishing Traveler, and that, that was the most recent license. And they did a crappy job. But it's so badly written. The good written. ones are not in print. Yeah. The, the, the older ones are easy to find but not in print. And the D20 ones, there's so many. Like I only have like a quarter of what's out there at best. Well, they have a ton. Down. They did a ton of supplements. Well, I, and I want to get them, but they're they're because they're becoming collector's items. Their price is going through the roof. Like there's one book, like the map of the Babylon galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was like seven hundred dollars. The the, the book pay. and the map, like in, insanely expensive. Um, and a lot of the books are going for hundreds of dollars. They're they're really well done. And they took you know modern D twenty. You only gain one hit point per level, so you do not want to get in combat because you're going to get shot by a PPG or something and you're done. Um, it, and they added the uh, diplomacy system. So it's all, because it was all, Babylon 5 was a, uh, basically a United Nations of Aliens, if you will. And it was, in, you know, a lot of intrigue and everything like Game of Thrones. But they had the diplomacy system and really, it, it's a fun setting. And of course, I know it really well. And... He based a lot of it on Tolkien as well. He's a big Tolkien fan. He has direct quotes in the show from Tolkien and, and from others. So he has a character who's a techno mage named Elric. Right. As in Stormbringer Elric Michael Moorcock. But then he quote he says, Meddle not in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Which is straight from Tolkien. Exactly. <laughs> There's many others like that. I prefer metal not in the fairs of dragons for your crunchy and it's good with ketchup. It's good with ketchup, yes. <laughs> uh, and a, a fun thing is that uh, he played, he pulled in a lot of history. And so he kind of did what Tolkien did, which is if you watch Babylon 5 every five years or so, all the current events going on right then, it looks like he was prescient. Because you'll watch it and go, wow, this is going on right now. Wow, this is going on right now, right? And it's because he, you know, those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it. He just drew from history. Yeah. And so all those things that have happened through history, like the Night Watch, all these things are uh, throughout history have happened time and time again. He incorporated all of them into it. And so it's so applicable with each changing generation. You, you can see how it directly applies to what's happening now. Even though it was, you know, he wrote it back in the 80s and it was produced in the 90s. Right. Um, yeah. And I hope someday he gets enough zeros, because he said he's trying to get one more zero behind his name to produce the movies. So, because he doesn't have the TV rights, those have been buried by Warner Brothers and company, but he retains the movie rights to make as many movies as he wants. So, but he needs one more digit, he said, for him to do it right the way he wants to do it. So... And also, every actor who was on that set said it was the best run set they'd ever been on. Right. So, anyway, I was going my tangents to Babylon 5. Sorry. <laughs> I, I can't tell which is my favorite setting. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll check this one out eventually. Uh, we did also pick up, because Carla had recommended it, the limited edition rule book of Adventures in Time and Space, in addition to the many others that we already have, including the latest edition. Um... So she claimed that there were a couple of 
tidbits in there. That I think one having. of the first tidbits is the um, character sheets in the back mm -hmm. um, to include uh, some and non canonical um, characters, so they don't have a photo of the actor that played it, like Rockstar, um, Adventurous Archaeologist. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, some of them do, some of them don't. But that, that's the same with the other editions, too. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, and we also did pick up, so we already had GURPS Supers, which is part of the two books that you need to run a superhero campaign using the GURPS system, generic universal role-playing system from Steve Jackson Games. So Powers has arrived. That's the second of the two books because we're evaluating different superhero game systems. And this is published June 2017, so it's not, not that old. Wow. And readily available in print. Uh, so if you go to our website, rpgresearch.com forward slash blog, you will see we're doing a running list of all the different superhero game systems we're evaluating because we're trying to pick one to standardize training for all of our GMs and to offer in our Tier 1 programs. Because a lot of, right now, superheroes are pretty popular, and so we want to be able to offer that, but we're having trouble picking one that's in print, has to have physically in print, PDF's great as well, but it has right. to have physical print. Even if it's print on demand through drive through RPG, that's that's sufficient. But it's got to be easy to get in print. Having to go take it to the store or another online site like Lulu to get it print on demand for you does not qualify. Right. Because that can have legal issues. So it has to be, you know, legally available in print. And there have been a lot of superhero games that have come and gone, come and gone. Some have been Kickstarter, some have been the three different Marvel systems, DC, etc. Um, but we're evaluating ones that are in print. Uh, so the other superhero one, you know, and we've got many, we've got half a dozen we're looking at right now, is Masks, A New Generation. This is basically based on more like the Teen Titans. This is meant for teenagers who want to do superheroes. I'm going to go ahead and break the seal now. I didn't break it during the talk show. And take a look inside. And then we've got one other that we're probably going to try to run tonight. Uh, a starter set that claims everything we need to start playing right away is in the box. We can just open it and start playing. And we always like to test that premise, because so far, the only one we found since the 1983 Frank Menser is the brand new Call of Cthulhu 7th edition starter kit, which we did, Riley and Danielle and I. And that did work to jump right in and start playing, but not to start GMing. It had a solo adventure that, was, that worked. And we managed, between all of us, to blow up five square miles of 15. New Hampshire. Fifteen square miles, sorry. Fifteen square miles of New Hampshire. <laughs> Isn't it all of New Hampshire? <laughs> no. <laughs> Two of my sons live there, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. So I have finally opened it. Do, do, do. The seal is broken. The seal is broken. Is it the seventh seal? <laughs> yeah. What is Masks? Chapter Zero, the preface. When you play Masks... You and your friends tell a story, almost as if you're writing a comic together, each of you taking on the roles of the main characters in the story. Actual play is like a conversation, with you and your friends talking about those characters, what they do and what happens. You're each co-authors and readers. You get to guide where the story goes, and you get to be excited when it goes somewhere you never expected. Unlike regular comic books, Masks has rules that take you places you didn't expect, keep things exciting and surprising, and guide you through what to say and when. So when you fling a car at the T-Rex, instead of just saying what happens, the rules jump in and help fill in the next step. Uh, John, you want to read the next little bit? Because i got to eat a little something. My blood sugar is getting low. I'm okay. Share from uh, my needing to eat here. Death by T-Rex. Okay. Um, Tales to Astonish. In addition to the story itself, Mask is about awesome, over-the-top superheroic shenanigans. And what kind of superhero stuff is just damn fun? Ridiculous? Sure. A bit stupid from time to time? Yeah, totally. But damn fun? Without a doubt. What other stories give you time travelers, sorcerers, mutants, aliens, and some guy with a bow all the same team? Mask is the first and foremost about a team of young superheroes. Their friends, rivals, love interests, allies, and always teammates. Joint stars of their comics and superheroes. They're young, they've got abilities, and make them special. They wear costumes, they use code names, they save people, and they do it together. 
They're growing up in Halcyon City, a place with plenty of older superheroes who provide an endless clamor of voices telling them who to be, and those young heroes are all trying to figure out on their own way. All of those pieces are key. You might have some, sorry, you might have awesome story ideas about the premier team of superheroes, or a crazy group of misfits on a spaceship or genetic superhumans fighting to protect a world that hates or fears them. But Masks, as it's presented in this book, isn't written for those stories. You'll find pieces of those tales, but the core of the game is different. Alcyon City is a massive, bustling mega megapolis. Countless people from countless cultures and walks of life populate the great city. It's a contradictory and wonderful combination of dark and light, crime and heroism, corruption and hope, past mistakes and the promises of change. It's always been the city of tomorrow and yesterday. That's never been more true than today. Alcyon is the focal point of the super-powered extra-normal world. The city's always had more than its share of strange heroes and goings on, but since the late 1930s, it's played home to more superhumans and their kin than any other place on Earth. And the city has evolved to fit its population. Construction crews work at ridiculous speeds to repair the damage done in superhuman brawls. Halcyon hosts the headquarters of Aegis, A-E-G-I-S, the Advanced Expert Group for Intervention and Security, an elite government agency that rose specifically deal with superhumans among other weird secret and superhuman oriented organizations. So Marvel equivalent would be Agents of Shield. Right, but Aegis I think is also DC. Oh is it? I think so. I believe I Aegis know. exists within DC. I didn't know that. At least within the world of the on uh, the television show. Hmm. Um the uh, a yeah, I'm thinking that the people, was here, he could tell us. <laughs> I think Aegis is the people that actually run the Suicide Squad. Oh. A E G I S. Over the course of 80 years or so of superheroes, Halcyon City has seen three relatively distinct generations of superheroes rise and fall. These three generations are known quickly as the Gold Generation, the Silver Generation, and the Bronze Generation. Uh, that was the key comic book terms. The old age of comics, Silver Age, Bronze Age. Okay. And now there's a new generation rising. The children of other superheroes and trainees of prior generations or brand new superpowered individuals all trying to figure out who they are in the midst of Halcyon City's own special brown of wonder and insanity. So did you find out about Aegis? Um, there, it... Seem like there might be one, and then there's also a superhero named Aegis. Okay. So, yes. All right. Let me take a look at that. Thank you, John. I wolfed all that down. <laughs> so here's the key thing. In masks, you play characters who are approximately 16 to 20 years old. That's a key thing mm -hmm. compared to the other supers. It could be whatever. Yeah. With allowances made for stuff like the alien who actually 1,000 years old and still a teenager in mind and body. Okay. Elf. They're trying to figure out who they are, but they're not so young as to have no idea at all. The trouble is all these adults around them telling them what to do and who to be. It's the story we all face as we grow up. We don't just become exactly what our parents, teachers, or mentors want us to be. And we don't completely abandon or ignore what they say either, whether we want to or not. This is promising for at-risk populations, this yes. perspective. Playing to find out. There may be times while playing masks when you say, Oh, I know exactly what happens next. You feel like you have the best possible idea for a stream of events to take your character to some interesting place and you just want to say what those are. Don't. The characters in Mass don't really know where they belong, where they'll end up, who they'll become, and you don't either. This is a story of uncertainty and discovery. Don't cheat yourself out of that excitement by planning the next dramatic arc in detail. The mechanics in Masks will push you in new and different directions, taking you places you wouldn't have expected. 
So much of the fun of masks lies in the surprise of finding out what happens, who the characters are becoming without knowing in advance. Commit yourself to that uncertainty, you'll be glad you did. So where this came from. Mass borrows its rules framework and many ideas about stories and storytelling from the game Apocalypse World by D. Vincent Baker. Any familiarity? The Apocalypse Now setting uh, system that you use for many games now. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, Apocalypse World is a mature game, think R rating, about the post-apocalyptic wastelands. Mass is pretty different in terms of subject matter and style, but the basic spine of both games is in the same. Is the same. You don't need Apocalypse World to play Masks. Everything you need to play this game is included in this book. But if you want to take a look at Apocalypse World and you're comfortable with its mature content level, then it's well worth your time. Masks also comes from a long tradition of young superhero stories. Here are a few worth checking out to get an idea of the style and theme of Masks. Young Justice, an American animated TV show created by Brandon Vetti and Greg Weiss Weissman. Mm -hmm. You guys are familiar with that? Yep. Okay, young of everybody's still waiting for the next season that's about five six years overdue okay <laughs> young avengers volume one by alan heinberg and jim chung and volume two by kirian gillen and jamie mckelvey young avengers i'm not sure i know the avengers well, I, can, I can assume what that is. yeah you can make assumptions yeah <laughs> avengers academy by christos gage and mike mccone runaways by brian k vaughn and I'm adrian alfona them. what's that Runaways, I'm familiar with them. You can actually watch uh, Runaways on Hulu, though it is a comic book first. Okay. Uh, Teen Titans, that's the only one so far that I recognize, because <laughs> of my boys years ago. The original Cartoon Network show, as well as the original Marv Wolfman comics and the Jeff Johns issues. I assume you guys are all familiar with Teen Titans. Yes. Because if I am, then you guys probably are. <laughs> Miss Marvel, or Ms. Marvel, Ms. Marvel. Uh, by G. Willow Wilson and Adrian Alfona. Both Alfona. versions of it. The, the latest version is a... Um, well, the original version is a, a human that was given a blood transfusion by aliens, but the other version is a, um, a young person who she gained it through some magical thing, but she can warp her body, and she's Muslim. Okay. Uh, Wolverine and the X-Men, I do know that one, by Jason Aaron and Chris Bacalo. Young Avengers is uh, Marvel, so it's, I'm assuming it's an answer to... The Avengers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Young Justice. Meanwhile, in Justice League... <laughs> Um, to play Bash, you'll need a few friends willing to commit to playing at least one two to four hour session. A single session of Mass is fun, but the game really sings when you play multiple linked sessions. Okay. Then you need a GM. And then you need dice. You need two six sided dice, kind you find a Monopoly. One pair is enough to play, but it's better to have um, a lot better to have one pair of dice for each player. So just 2d6. Ooh, that's light. Playbooks, pencils and paper, additional materials, tokens for influence. Some inspirational art and pictures, printed copies of the basic moves, one for each player, printed copy of the GM materials. You can find the playbooks and move sheets for running the game as downloads at magpiegames.com forward slash masks. We'll have to do that. Um, the Why Masks? The name of the game is Masks. There's a rule piece in the game called Pierce the Mask. The chapter including the playbooks is called The Masks. Why such an emphasis on masks? On one level, the game is about superheroes, and the association of masks with those costumed super people is pretty well ingrained thanks to nearly a century of such stories. But on another level, the game is about appearances, image, and perception. It's about the conflict between what you seem to be and what you actually are. Everybody wears masks. Everyone's fitting into some kind of image or mold, playing some kind of role. Everyone has a mask to pierce, even if they're not wearing anything on their face. The playbooks you choose, the appearances of your characters, their secret identities, and their superhero names, all masks of one form or another. Otherwise known as facades. Uh, uh, embrace masks. Revel in putting them on, taking them off, trying on new ones, abandoning old ones. Which is, again, a key part of adolescence, is trying on all these different roles and seeing what fits and doesn't fit. 
Then it goes into the history of the city, etc. So this will take a little bit of time to read through and get familiar with. So it's not something we can jump right in and start playing. Um, although it looks like it won't take too much uh, preparation. It's a very rules light system. I mean, just 2D, 2D6 is really light. <laughs> you have very limited options there. It's Magpie Games? Excuse me. Yes, magpiegames.com forward slash masks. Um, but there's a there's a number of different features and charts and such, and each superhero has different abilities. So when we get a chance to read through it more, we'll we'll run through a test of this to be sure okay. as we evaluate. I, it sounds promising. I like it sounds it. very promising for our at risk youth groups, definitely. Yeah. That that sounds totally targeted for that population, and uh, and so we definitely will need to do a good thorough run through with it once or twice or thrice. All right, now here's one that claims everything you need in the box is ready to open and start playing. So, you know, I love the idea of a starter kit to help people be introduced to role-playing right away. You know, it's Christmas morning or your birthday, and you and your friends can sit down and start playing right away. Unfortunately, I have not seen a successful implementation of that since 1983 with the basic D&D Red Box Frank Metzer version, which walks you with both the players and the DM through their first time, through multiple sessions. Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition Starter Kit has a good start for learning to play, but they have not made it that you can just start GMing a group right away. You can only play solo. So Numenera, Monty Cook Games. We already run their No Thank You Evil games uh, to, to great success with different populations. That's geared for ages 5 on up. We've run as young as 4 years old with assistance and such. This is geared for ages 13 on up, according to the box. And uh, it's supposed to be that this is the ninth incarnation of this world of Numenera and this is just the starter set it's not the complete core rule books are anxious enough uh, an introduction to tabletop role playing in the incredible ninth world setting by Numenera uh, of Numenera by Monty Cook <laughs> now wasn't Monty Cook a key part of third edition D&D &D development yes yeah he was a key part of that he's also in the gamers 2 darkness rising he is I one know. of the uh Cleric Paladins, whatever, when they go in to resurrect the Bard. Um, and he and he's the one that the monk freezes, and he's like, sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> that's Monty Cook. Okay. Doing his little cameo. At least I'm pretty sure that's him. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cameos from a lot of gamer folks in the gamer's shows. So uh, that's his little um, cameo. <laughs> if you get a chance to check it out. To yeah, lots of fun little tidbits. All right, we're going to open the box. Because it claims, now we only have three of us here because uh, people are sick and such, but it claims everything we need. So it says, um, gather your friends, open this box, and begin playing right away. Doesn't say read through it first. No. It says begin playing right away. So maybe this is it. Maybe we finally found a modern starter set that lives up to actually being a starter kit. So you, uh, we've got XP cards. A D6 and a D20. Of course, we have plenty more of those around. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we can ever find a D20 inside. <laughs> a bunch of little booklets and character sheets and what have you. I think that's it. There's a lot of space holder in here. I think that's it. Yeah, I, I don't like those things. But they have to make the box big enough to show up screen. on the spine to show up. Yeah, it's a whole publishing history thing. All right, so oh, before... These are GM intrusion cards as well as the experience cards. Cool. So, Numenera, before you start, there's a small little card handout. So, before we start, how to use all the cool stuff in this set to have a great game. One, character sheets. There are five characters in the box... So that's these here. John. Give something cool back. Each player should choose one they want to play. One person is the game master, however, and doesn't choose a character. That would be me. Number two, book one. Uh-oh. Guess what it says? Read this first. It tells you about all the stuff on the character sheets and how to play Numenera. Well, hopefully it walks you through, I mean, it says right on it, read this first, starter set book one. Then it says, book two, only the GM should read this. 
It has all the details of the adventure that the characters will undertake, including secrets they shouldn't discover until the game begins. It also has some extra information for the GM. Number four, map. Only the GM should look at this, at least at first. It shows important locations for the adventure. So you guys look away while I'll show the audience. <laughs> We're gonna look at the vortex, the temple of the vortex. Ooh. I want to point out something that uh, an immediate observation. Okay. Uh, preparing to no thank you evil. Mm hmm. Carl name is a swift descriptor. Oh, they use the same guy. style. Yeah, who yeah. builds two weapons. Right, with uh, the focus. with the adjectives and verbs and nouns. Because this is the same. It's a cipher system. Cipher system, yeah. So that's what we expected. Number five, cards. There are XP cards and GM intrusion cards. GM uh, XP cards are awarded to the players as described in Book 1. GM intrusion cards are helpful idea generators for the Game Master. The GM should keep both kinds of cards handy for use during the game. So hand those back to me, please. Uh, okay. Intrusion both types. and experience? Yep. yep. Thank you. And you need the dice? Um, are we I, don't know. Dice? I don't know. <laughs> dice. The players will be rolling these as they do things in the game as described in Book 1. Seven, cheat sheet. This is a quick reference for the Numenera rules you are most likely to need while the game's going on. This should be shared by all the players and the GM, so we don't want to make multiple copies of it. Right. So it has pools, effort, edge, assets, skills, armor, weapon damage, task difficulty. All right, so it says read book one first. And we had to do that with the Cthulhu one and also with, you know, Beck Me. So, you know, depends on what it has us do. Table of Contents is a very basic table of contents. There are four items listed. An Introduction to the Ninth World on page two. Understanding Your Character, page seven. How to Play Numenera, page 14. And Glossary, glossary page 32. So on 32 pages, there are only four table of contents listings. There is no index. Hmm. Yeah. You know my pet peeve about bad TOC and index. Yep. So that's just laziness. I want to be able to find my stuff quickly. Yep. And I know it's just an intro, but still with 32 pages, you want to know what's where. So I'm having to flip through, flip through, flip through. Uh, really heavy stock for a, for a soft cover. Very good mm -hmm. heavy stock. Really high quality print paper here. The world of the far, far future awaits. Numenera is a role-playing game where players take on the role of characters living in a science fantasy world. In this game, characters seek to discover the wonders of the past to help them build a better present and even a future. One player takes on the role of the game master, GM, and that person guides the joint story all the players create together. The GM should read both this book and book two. The other players should read at least the first two chapters of this book. Or the GM should summarize it for them. That's what we're doing. The players need to understand a bit about the setting and the basics of how their characters work. The GM is the only one who really needs to know the rest of the rules. All players are free to read this book. Only the GM should read book two. An introduction to the ninth world. So there's a whole couple pages of text there. More pages, Numenera, artifacts, ciphers, oddities. Okay, so what is it they're doing wrong here for a starter kit? Because uh, I'm now on page seven and I'm only now getting to understanding your character. So they front and loaded about Numenera, yeah. the setting. What is an issue with that with a starter kit? Um, this is not give us the example play right away, get you in there. It's trying to front-end load and help your characters know so... Getting all the rules up front and then starting to play. Yeah, you're front-end loading. So you've got to read... I've already had to read through four pages of the setting. And they're not hard read at all. But it says we can open the box and start playing right away, right? It says, open this box and begin to playing right away. 
Are we playing yet? Are you? No, I might have missed something. <laughs> um, I got to read four pages of background. Well, I'm skipping that for now. Right. Page seven is understanding your character. Take a look at the player character PCs that come in this box. There are five of them, each different with skills, abilities, strengths, and weaknesses distinct from the others. Each player should choose one. The information in this chapter is designed to explain much of what you'll find on those sheets. Don't worry if you're unclear about some of the information on the sheet. When you start the game, you'll learn as you go. I hope that's true. Character descriptor, type, and focus goes on for the rest of the page. The next page, effort, effort and damage, skills and inabilities, special abilities, ciphers and oddities, and on page 12, anoic, anoetic ciphers and occultic ciphers, equipment and shins. Um, and then finally we get to number 14, how to play Numenera. Are we playing yet? No. Okay. Numenera is played in the joint imagination of all the players, including the GM. The GM sets the scene, the players state what their characters attempt to do, and the GM determines what happens next. One scene logically flows to the next. You might start in a town, travel across the wilderness, and eventually end up at the site of a prior world ruin. And before you know it, you've got a story as compelling as any you've read or watched. Um, blah, 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 blah. This is how you play Numenera. The player tells the GM what they want to do. This is a character action. Two, the GM determines if the action is ridiculous. Blah, 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 blah. So now we've got taking action. When do you roll? Determining task stat. Determining task difficulty. Task difficulty chart, which is also on the cheat list. Modifying difficulty. Combat, light weapons, medium weapons, heavy weapons, attack modifiers, special situations, dealing and suffering damage, page 19 now. Page 20, uh, we'll provide a cheat sheet, uh, ambient damage, the effects of taking damage. Page 21, recovering points in a pool. Are you page it? 22, recovery rolls. Page 23, helping and special rolls. Page 26, range and speed, immediate distance, short distance, long distance, another example, intrusion. Page 27, combat will be an important part of Numenera for some people. However, this is your choice. Numenera doesn't have to be a game about combat. That's nice. Uh, page 30, exploration and discovery. Page 31, experience points. You don't earn XP for killing foes or overcoming standard challenges in the course of the play. Discovery is the soul of Numenera. Well, we like that. And 32, glossary. And then, then there's want more, and it tells you to buy the core rulebook. Did we start playing yet? I and we didn't part. really read 32 pages. We just skimmed. Right. Because otherwise it'll take up all our time. All right, well, let me see what it does for the GM to see if I can start GMing you guys right away and just jump in. Let's see if it does that. Table contents. Only four items out of many pages. There are... Is there an index in the back of this one? Nope. 32 pages and no index and four items on the table of contents. Again, very high quality, really good quality printed paper, really good quality, um, you know, for a soft cover. Mastering the game, vortex, ciphers, and being a game master. So mastering the game. Please do not read this book. In, in fact, players, please do not read this book. In fact, for the game to work at its best, only game masters should read this book. Now, who was it? Uh, Robin's Laws of the good game mastering totally disagrees with that premise. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, well, it depends on the context and blah, 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 blah. Uh, seriously, player, stop reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so game masters are dot, dot, dot. Wait a minute. Player, I said stop reading. You're going to ruin the fun for yourself and maybe everyone else. Go back to looking at the character sheets. They're really cool. <laughs> I like the humor. All right, Game Masters, GMs are different from the other players. You guide the story along while they make choices, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we know this. Big, bold letters, only Game Masters should read this book. It says it over and over. Page 2, Vortex. Vortex is a Numenera adventure. This means that it's story-focused and open-ended. To use Vortex properly and run a smooth Numenera adventure, the GM must understand what the players can do as they wish, that the players can do as they wish, and not just what you wish. Thus, this adventure is not written linearly. It does not start the PCs at point A, force them to go to point B, and eventually end up at point C. That's pretty challenging on an intro. That's right. That's problematic. If, if you have somebody who's never GM'd and role-played, never role-played before, 
and you want them to do this without holding their hand, I get it. I'm totally for the sandbox thing in once you have people who got a little more experience. Yeah. But the first time should be linear to help hold their hand through the process. Or if not linear, very structured. So in Menster, what they did is it's linear in that the play, there's a map, and then each map location, you get a description. But the players can choose which way they go. It's just it's a dungeon crawl, and so it's right. very structured that way. But the, but the players get to decide what order. Um, gives as much information about all locations as possible, and then lets the PCs loose. Uh, your job as a GM is to try to keep up so that when the players want to go to a location, you're ready to tell them what's there and what happens when they take action there. Numenera's, Numenera is not a rules-heavy game, but it is a story-heavy game. game. They're not expected to memorize hundreds of pages of rules, but you are expected to help the players tell a good story, and that means giving them the freedom to go where they want. Sounds good. I like that. Once the PCs have the initial encounter found on page 15, they can go to the nearby town of Jute. They can find their way into the strange and ancient blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's all, you know, spoilers. Preparing to be the game master for Vortex. GM should read the whole adventure. Obviously, read the background first, and then the section on the cast of NPCs, in this case, the cultists. Next, read about the locations involved in the adventure. As you do, you'll need to consider what will happen if the PCs take different actions in the context of all of it. Use the section on handling the different sets of events. When you're ready to start play, use the initial counter to get the ball rolling. Okay, so we can't play this tonight. There's no, no. way I'm going to have enough time to read all this. We cannot jump in and start playing. False advertising... Which which is everybody. Yes. Cthulhu, at least I can start playing, but, you know, solo. So let's do that. Let's. I've talked about it enough times. Let's break out the Frank Metzger book and do it. Okay, let's do that. How's that sound? Yeah. There we go. It's basic D and D. It's a piece of cake. Yeah, Beckman is back on. You can get. You can get. You can get. You can get the rule cyclopedia. The entire Beckman rule cyclopedia is in print. The solo adventure you have to get. You can only get the PDF. So that's a problem as far as I wish that was in print, but you can at least play the game system. So just to clarify, the Game Master has to read 64 pages Yes, to prepare. Before we can start playing. And they consider that getting playing right away. <laughs> and and, and, and there, I'm not singling out Monty Cook. No. This is what everybody keeps doing except Cthulhu. They at least got it on the player side. We literally were able to read the intro start playing right away, and we, we finished reading through the initial introduction and finished the game in two and a half hours. Star Wars made a decent attempt at it, but I still felt I needed you to read it. You still had to reread. Yeah, yeah, you still had to reread it uh, ahead of time. Cthulhu, we did not have to do that to play solo. We yeah. shared the solo experience, but to get playing right away, at least the player part I could do right away. The GM side, though, said that now you've got to read everything else first. And again, I get it. That's normally what you got to do as an experienced GM. We all do that. But if you truly want to bring in new people at the easiest rate possible to the widest, most inclusive, accessible audience, we're going to show what works, which is the layered knowledge of Frank Metzler's approach. Maybe there will eventually be a Numenera Choose Your Own Adventure. <laughs> Copyright. Well, I'm starting to think if somebody else doesn't do it, we're going to have to do it. Yeah. We're going to have to create, but because nothing since 1983. Ugh, crack. No, this does not have the Menzer copy in it, right? This is just the that does not. That's the, as far as I know, double check, but as far as I know, that's missing, unfortunately. Mystera. Yeah, that's the D&D &D world. Okay, now I got multiple copies. Okay. So I each have one. So one's This is print on demand. Ah. That's original, that's print on demand. It's thick Thicker pieces of paper. Okay, this is all you need. No, this has more pages. Yeah, that's the setting. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All right. We have the player's manual and the dungeon master's rule book. It says read this book first. Hey, that's just like what Monty Cooks does, right? Yeah. And then says read this book next. Okay, we're right par for the course. I open it, and there's a preface, which is actually in the cover. It's not even really a physical page. It's part of the cover. And it says, this is a game that is fun. It helps you imagine. Quote, 
As you whirl around, your sword ready, the huge red fire-breathing dragon swoops toward you with a roar! End quote. See? Your imagination woke up already. How's that for a start, by the way? I'm scared! This game may be more fun than any other game you have ever played! Exclamation mark. The Dungeons and Dragons game is a way for us to imagine together, like watching the same movie or reading the same book. By the way, we're starting this at 6.47 p.m. Uh, um, but you can write the stories without putting a word on paper, just by playing the D&D game. You, along with your friends, will create a great fantasy story. You will put it away after each game and go back to school or work, but like a book, the adventure will wait. It's better than a book, though. It will keep going as long as you like. It is nearly the most popular game ever made. This is back in 1983. Mm -hmm. And you will see why in just a bit. When you bought some other game or book, did you ever think, gee, that's nice, but it's not quite what I thought it would be? Well, your D&D adventures will be just what you want because you're the ones making them up. And it's not hard. It takes a little reading and a little thinking, but most of all, it's fun. It's fun when you discover that nobody loses and everybody wins. It's fun when you get good at the game. For example, knowing what to expect in a cobalt cave and which dragons are on your side. And you don't have to put in a coin each time like many other games. This is back <laughs> in the arcade game days yeah. before home consoles Flashback. were really ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah, we're showing our age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, once you have these rules, you don't need anything else. There's more, of course, if you want it. Exciting adventures to play, miniature figures of monsters and characters, expert rules for more experienced players, and lots more. But you already have everything you need to start. This package and your imagination, that will do. Now, this is the box set, which came with a set of dice and everything in the original version. Oh, uh, yes, it does cost one more thing, which you also have right now. A bit of time. It takes a few minutes to learn the basic rules and another hour or two to play a full game. Did you hear that? A few minutes to learn the basic rules and an hour or two to play a full game. Now, what were we looking at with all these other starter sets except for the Cthulhu play, solo play? Yeah. Hours of preparation. Right. To then get to do some play. How long does it take you normally to read 64 pages? Yeah, well, in this, okay, I mean, the, keep in mind, so that one was 32 and 32, mm -hmm. and this one is 63 pages for the player's book and 48 pages for the gym. So it's actually larger, right. but it gets you started a lot faster. Um, you will probably want to spend more time and might even make it a hobby. Millions of people have. But for now, just sit back and imagine, quote, your character stands atop a grassy hill. The sun glints off your golden hair, rippling in the warm breeze. You absentmindedly rub the gem-studded hilt of your magic sword and glance over at the dwarf and elf bickering as usual about how to load the horses. The magic user has memorized her spells and says she's ready to go. A dangerous dungeon entrance gapes at you from the mountains nearby, and inside, a fearsome dragon awaits. Time to get moving. Have fun! Frank Metzer, February 1983. I checked for traps. So it says, how to use this book. You can learn how to play Dungeons & Dragons game by yourself, by yourself, simply by reading the next sections of this booklet. You don't have to memorize everything as you read. The first two adventures are designed to teach you while you play. If you are ready to learn, begin reading at start here. And then it explains a little bit more um, about the other sets and stuff that you can get. We'll, we'll skip through that. So we're going to jump to start here, which is page two. Oh, by the way, nice table of contents. Yep. Detailed table of contents. Useful. Index in the back? Um, well, you don't always need that if you have a good table of contents. Uh, there's a glossary, but no index. Okay. But it's got a good detailed table of contents. So that, that you know, I prefer both, but at least it's got one. All right, so I jumped to page two. Start here. A dungeon is a group of rooms and corridors in which monsters and treasures can be found. And you will find them as you play the role of a character in a fantasy world. There are many kinds of monsters, but dragons are the biggest and most dangerous and have the most treasure. You can start playing this game right now. 
without learning any rules and without anyone else to play with, exclamation mark. Just start reading and you will discover the basics of the game in a matter of minutes. During your first adventure, you will only need one of the dice in the box. The others will be used later. For now, all you will need is the roundish one with the numbers 1 to 20 on it. Use the crayon to fill in the numbers. Remember that? You just have to fill in the crayon. Yes, I do so remember that. So they came without any paint in, or anything in the numbers, so they were hard to read. Mm -hmm. So you had to actually, they'd give you a crayon to, wax, to rub it in, and the, the wax would fall into the numbers, and you'd rub, wipe it off. And you would do that yourself. That was how they used to be. <laughs> and then you had to occasionally reapply Yeah, the if, it, if they got hot in the sun or something like that, it all melt <laughs> out. And... <laughs> Um, and rub off extra wax with the tissue so only numbers are colored in. After you do that, get a pencil and paper and you're ready to start. Read this booklet just like any book. Don't skip around. This edition has been completely revised to introduce the game to you step by step. While you are reading the next sections, you will learn many things about the game. You do not have to memorize everything as you go along. By the time you've played the solo adventure, pages 13 to 22, you will know how to play the basic game. The rest of this booklet gives other details that you will need when playing the game with others. In group games, one person is the dungeon master and everyone else is a player. The dungeon master, or DM for short, runs the game, while the others play the roles of the characters. The other booklet in this set, Dungeon Master's Rulebook, gives all the information needed for running group games. What is role-playing? This is a role-playing game. That means that you... I want to read this because it'll be interesting to see what he says in 1983, right? Right. That means that you will be like an actor, imagining that you are someone else and pretending to be that character. You won't need a stage, though, and you won't need costumes or scripts. You only need to imagine. This game doesn't have a board because you won't need one. Besides, no board could have all the dungeons, dragons, monsters, and characters you will need. You need a closet, like you need a room like John's. <laughs> shelves and shelves and shelves of miniatures and background and terrain. And it's still not enough, is it? Never. <laughs> we need a bus and a trailer to haul it all, and it's still not enough, is it? Because <laughs> you're trying to capture your I imagination. I have my own dragon sword of miniatures yeah. and maps. Trying to capture your imagination in physical form, and that's exactly. infinite. Uh, for now, while you are learning, you will play a role in your imagination. Later, when the game, when you game with others, you will all be playing different roles and talking together as if you were the characters. It will be easy, but first you need to get ready. What role will I play? Imagine. It is another place, another time. The world is much like ours was long ago, with knights and castles and no science or technology, no electricity, no modern comforts of any kind. Imagine. Dragons are real. Werewolves are real. Monsters of all kinds live in caves and ancient ruins. And magic really works. Imagine. You are a strong hero. A famous but poor fighter. Day by day you explore the unknown, looking for monsters and treasure. The more you find, the more powerful and famous you become. Your character's basic abilities. Okay, so you will want some scratch paper and a pencil. It did say that much. Scratch paper. Do you have some non scratch paper? You Actually, really you're going to want some for mapping anyway. That's sick. So use, use part of it for your character and use the rest of it for mapping. <clears throat> In the game, you need some way of describing your character, the fighter you will pretend to be. We can say the fighter is, quote, strong, fairly nimble, not too smart. But we need to describe the character a little better than that. We call these descriptions abilities, strength, intelligence, and others. We measure each one with a number called an ability score. The highest score possible is 18 and the least is 3, for reasons we'll discuss later. You are, no, it's not front end loading that, it's just yeah. that, you know. You are a strong fighter. Your strength score is 17, nearly the highest possible. You are fairly nimble which means that you can move swiftly. The name for this ability is Dexterity. As a fighter, you don't need a high Dexterity score. Your Dexterity is 11, which is a little above average. A fighter often isn't very smart, at least that's the trope. Uh, your character isn't as smart as you are, but isn't stupid either. Let's say your character's intelligence is 9, which is a little below average. 
Now make a note of your ability scores anywhere in the middle of your sheet or pa of paper, or you can put it upper left hand corner, I'd recommend. Uh, 17 strength, 11 dexterity, 9 intelligence. STR, D, E, X, I, N, T. It doesn't say that. It says, it spells it out. Because <laughs> that's, that's more complexity. Right. I'll do abbreviate. <laughs> You also need equipment for adventuring. You are carrying a backpack and other items very similar to what you would carry when camping. Some of these items include food, water, rope, a lantern, and so forth. For now, just assume you have everything you need to survive in the wilderness. With monsters around, you need protection. You are wearing armor made of links of chain called chainmail and a helmet. You own a beautiful sword and have a dagger tucked into one boot just in case. You know how to use all of your equipment properly. If you like, you can give your fighter a name. It doesn't matter whether you are male or female. All set? Let's go. Your first adventure. So that was page two. We're now on page three. And we're ready to adventure. You've already started to make a character. Your hometown is just a small place with dirt roads. You set off one morning and hike to the nearby hills. Are we playing yet? Yep. Yep. Yep, we started playing. Uh, there, are, and so it's uh, 6.58. We started at 6.47, started reading through this. So 11 minutes with a lot of interjection. Yep. You set off one morning and hiked to the nearby hills. There are several caves in the hills, caves where treasures can be found guarded by monsters. You have heard that a man named Bargle may also be found in these caves. Bargle is a sort of bandit who has been stealing money, killing people, and terrorizing your town. If you can catch him, you can become a hero. As you approach the entrance, you look around. It's a nice day, and everything seems peaceful. You know that things aren't usually peaceful in caves where monsters live, and it's usually dark, too. So you get out your lantern and a tinderbox, matches haven't been invented yet, so the box has flint and steel, and carefully light the wick. The flame sputters a bit, but the oil soon burns with a soft glow. With your sword ready, you step into the cave. Yes, that's that's a pretty fancy cave entrance. Yeah, well, be be warned when they're fancy like that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a hint. Okay, so if we had a tech, I'd have a switch to D&D &D as far as our listings to the talk show, but oh well. Right. All right. It's dark and musty inside. A passage leads inward from the entrance going deeper into the hill. It looks like the only way to go, so you head in that direction, watching carefully for bats and other nasty creatures. Suddenly you see a goblin. He is smaller than you are and looks like an ugly little man with gray skin. He sees you, gives a scream, waves his sword, and attacks. You dodge his blow and raise your sword to swing. If the goblin hadn't attacked right away, you might have tried talking to him. But now you have no choice. You must fight for your life. I like that it interjected that little comment. Right. How to hit. So it didn't tell you all this in advance. It waited until you needed to know. In the game, whenever you try to hit a monster, there is a chance that you will miss. And, of course, a chance that you will hit. It is very hard for monsters to hit your fighter because of your fine chainmail armor. The goblin isn't as hard to hit because his armor is not nearly as good. To swing at the monster, you must make a hit roll. Roll the 20-sided die. If you roll an 11 or less, your character misses the goblin. What did you get, John? One. Ouch. Riley? Seven. All right. So you both missed. If you rolled a 12 or higher, you would have hit. The number is part of the combat rules. You will learn more about it as you continue. Again, not front end loading, just doing it as you need it. If you miss, the goblin tries again, but misses you. You can swing again, roll again, and see if you hit. I haven't even mentioned the word armor class yet. Yep, they're not they're not front end loading the, the five. They're not getting too technical. They're teaching you concepts first. Five and what? Two. So you both missed. I'm switching dice. <clears throat> I have two. <laughs> if you keep missing, keep rolling. The goblin is trying to hit you, but you keep dodging the blows. So, try again. Four, eight. Wow, you guys suck. Nineteen. All right. Nineteen. 
<laughs> oh, you guys are in sync. <laughs> you're you're two, two of the same people in uh, in the multiverse in parallel. <laughs> that was interesting. The mirror. Yeah, <laughs> the mirror. Yeah, mirror reality. Yeah, Actually, which one of you is evil? Universe, no, he's got the. He's wearing his sash. So he should, he's had the goatee, he's the evil mirror, remember? Yeah. They wear the sashes in, in well, various Star Trek. Well, I should wear the sash, because I have the goatee. Because you have the goatee, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, grab your, we don't have a purple one, do we? We did. We did? Yeah. Somebody take, take it? No, it's, I think it's underneath the box. There it is. Ah. Yeah, since you're not showing your purple shirt very much. Yeah, that much. Yeah, might as well wear your I sash. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Well, I brought in the other heater, and it's still not, ca it's so cold outside, it's not catching up. It's 57 in here. Um, but you're doing okay, right, Riley? Are you freezing? Yeah. You okay? Good, good. I, I like no, it chilly. He's, he's still not wearing clothes. So he's, uh, he is wearing, wearing clothes. clothes. We are a family-friendly show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you hit him. Yeah. He screams Rah! and runs away down the corridor into the darkness. Goblins can see in the dark, but you have wounded him. Damage and hit points. In the game, when any creature is hit, either monster or character, damage is caused. There is a way of keeping track of damage called hit points. The number of hit points is the amount of damage that a creature can take before being killed. Hit points can be any number. The more hit points we, the, a creature has, the harder it is to kill. We often use an abbreviation for hit points. It is HP. Yay. See, this is just spelling Good it factor. out. I By the way, know. it says for, uh, on the thing, it says for ages... Um, Ten and ten? up, yeah. yeah, ten and up is what what it's meant to be accessible for. I remember it. And then as you go up in the books, it says twelve and then fourteen. Um, <clears throat> your fighter starts with eight HP hit points and still has all eight since the goblin never hit you. Uh, he may have hit your armor or shield, but never got through your protection. So these attacks are still called misses. They didn't actually damage your character. Constitution, your health. Your fighter is healthy and can fight a long time without tiring. This ability is measured by another ability score called Constitution. Your Constitution is 16, well above average, but not perfect. Your Constitution affects your hit points. If you have a low score, you might have only have two or three hit points. On the other hand, if you had an 18 Constitution, you might have as many as 10 hit points or more. Write your new ability score under the others on your sheet, 16 Constitution. Near the top of the page, above the ability scores, make a note of your hit points. Hit points eight. Now, back to your adventure. <laughs> right, a little <laughs> commercial interlude there. <clears throat> so, what do you think of so far? Uh, much better. We're already playing. We already understand. We're learning the rules bit by bit as we're going through, and we ha we haven't stopped playing yet. Riley. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you'd like to interject? Um, it's I don't I don't know how the GM side is because I'm not a big GM right now. Um, yeah, we're not up to the GM level yet. This is just you learning. If you were you're learning this yourself, each player learns by themselves. Yeah, because there's no choices yet. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, no. You'll get to do choices in I know. this. I, that's why I said yeah. 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 All right. You stop for a moment to be sure that you are all right, and then continue down the corridor. There are no side passages, no other way to go. Literally railroaded. <laughs> choo, choo. Ahead, the corridor leads into a wider area, which we will call a chamber. You carefully approach the chamber, shining your lantern around to see if anything is there. A hiss comes from a corner of the room to your left, and there you see a huge rattlesnake, almost ten feet long, oh. near it on the floor are hundreds of gold and silver coins. Well, that's why they taught you constitution to prepare for what comes next. <laughs> Talking to a snake will do no good at all, and you can't just sneak past it. Again, you must fight it. For this battle, you will keep track of hit points. The snake has three hit points. You could put that on a post-it if you wanted to, or not. It's up to you. Three hit points. Three hit points. On your sheet of paper near the bottom, right, snake three, leaving some room to keep track of the snake's damage. That's fine. This time, you will need to roll an 11 or higher to hit the snake. 
It's slower and easier to hit than the goblin was, but the snake has a better chance of hitting you than the goblin did because it's bigger and tougher. So go ahead and roll to see if you hit the snake. 11! Another four. Uh, what's a 16 if I count it? Floor does not count. This is a tabletop role-playing game, uh, not a floor role-playing game. <laughs> tabletop is one word, so TRPG, not TTRPG. <laughs> Going to spread that to our huge audience. <laughs> Three. Um, okay. So you did you both hit? Yes. All right. I barely hit. Yeah. If you hit the snake, cross off the three and write a two next to it. You have damaged the snake. If you miss, don't do anything. So you took one hit point off. So you just put a slash through and right below it a two instead of erasing. Uh, which, by the way, is good practice as a GM to slash and write and slash and write rather than erasing because it can help you follow a flow in case you, in case you make a mistake and you need to roll back. So show your work like in math. Same thing, same thing. I, hate my work. I know, I know, but it, it does help. Because if you have to roll things back, you have an audit trail. Uh, double ledger. <laughs> the snake then bites at you and hits. No! At the top sheet, cross off the eight after the word's hit points and write a seven next to it. While playing a D&D game by yourself, you should use this method to keep track of your hit points and the hit points of the monster you meet. Poisoned? Question mark. This is a poisonous snake, which can be very dangerous. That reminds me of paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the game, there is a way of finding out whether the poison hurt you or not. Roll the 20-sided die again. Ah. 16. 10. If you rolled a 12 or higher, that means you dodged before the snake could inject its poison, but you still take damage from the bite. If you roll an 11 or less, your fighter takes two more points of damage from the poison. Cross off the 7 and write a 5. You made this roll to see if you saved yourself from trouble. This roll is called a saving throw, and it will be used later in many other situations in the game. Your fighter swings again. Go ahead and roll. Remember, if you roll an 11 or higher, you hit and can subtract one hit point from the snake. If you miss, do nothing. You both missed? Six. Okay. Seven. The snake bites your fighter again. You lose one more hit point and must make another saving no. throw. 12. 12. 12 or higher to save. If you don't, no. you'll lose, if you roll an 11 or less, you lose another two hit points from poison damage. I'm going to... Well, I have four still, but I don't like it. You can now swing again. Can't do it. Come on, 20, 20. I landed. Uh, Two. I got 15. Okay. So if the snake still lives, okay, so you can swing again. Uh, 11 or higher to hit. If you hit, take away another hit point. You missed. Um, if the snake lives, lives, it bites, but misses. In this battle, the snake won't hit anymore. In a regular game, it might kill your fighter before you hit it at all. Go ahead and roll again to attack it. Real numbers. Real numbers. Not 20! All right, which doesn't mean anything in this game. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not sure it ever no, does. No, there's, there's no crits. Crit. Yeah, yeah, Gygax was against that initially. I killed the snake. All right. The snake will keep attacking, but it'll keep missing. Your fighter may have to swing many times, but sooner or later you will kill the snake. Make all the practice rolls you need. When the snake's hit points become zero, the snake is dead. If your hit points ever reach zero, you're dead. Well, your character's dead. <laughs> yeah, I'm dead at heart. <laughs> Luckily, you're dead. Dead inside. <laughs> you are hurt, but there is nothing you can do about it right now. The damage your fighter has taken can be healed by a few days' rest. The dead snake is not dangerous, so you get to work. You pick up the many coins and put them in cloth sacks you brought with you. As you are doing this, you notice that beside the gold, besides the gold, there are three types of silvery coins. Most are silver, but others are more valuable metals called electrum and platinum. Ooh -hoo! This is a rich treasure. Snakes usually have none. The treasure probably belonged to someone else who tried to kill the snake but failed. Sometimes treasure could be hidden. 
Looking carefully around the room, you find a small gem, a pearl, in one corner. It may be worth 100 gold pieces itself. After resting a bit to catch your breath, you shine the lantern around and see another corridor leading further into the darkness. That should be farther in the darkness, but okay. Uh, looking back the way you came, you see the light of day shining in the cave entrance in the distance. It looks tempting, but you remind yourself that you are a courageous fighter and shouldn't run away just because of a little fighting. Remember, though, that you are hurt. If you continue on, beware. If you see another snake or something else that looks as dangerous, you should probably go back. Don't get killed. Live to fight another day. The treasure will wait. You carefully start down the corridor into the unknown, your lantern held high and, corridor and sword ready. The corridor leads to another small cave. As you approach, you hear a voice and see a light. You pull the shutters closed on your lantern so you can hide better and carefully peek around the corner. To your right, sitting by the cave wall, is a beautiful woman wearing armor like yours. She has no sword, but has a rod with a metal ball on one end. This is a weapon called a mace. A lit lantern is on the floor next to her. She seems to be meditating or praying. You decide she might not wish to be disturbed, but as you try to quietly tiptoe past, she looks up and says, Greetings, friend. Looking for the goblin? You might... Oh, you are hurt. May I help? She watches you carefully in case you are dangerous, but seems to want to help. She looks familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a, they reuse Tika a lot of... No, 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 no. That's not even close to Tika. She would be closer to Lorana or... Uh, uh, gold moon or something of the blonde. Tika was a was a red headed curly right. haired, Real but blonde. it's the same artist. It's all yeah. El Elmore or something. It's all Larry Elmore. I'm pretty sure because that was that whole time period. Good artwork, I thought. I like that style. I loved his yeah. style. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not this anime over giant swords. You know, it, yeah. The swords that you couldn't lift, let alone swing. <laughs> yeah. Um. She, you apologize for disturbing her, but you wonder what she knows about the goblin and, most of all, how she could help you. But wait, she might be an enemy. Keeping your sword ready, you move closer. She stands and says, My name is Alina. I'm a cleric, an adventurer like yourself. I live in the town nearby and came here seeking monsters and treasure. Do you know about clerics? Stop and imagine that you're, what your character would, stay, would say. Back in town, she might be one of your neighbors, you are not sure, but you don't know about clerics. After listening to you, she says, Well, the goblin went that way, and points toward a corridor leading out of the room. He came through here so fast I almost didn't see him. You hit him? Good for you. Goblins are nasty. Nasty. Since you don't know about clerics, let me explain. Clerics are trained in fighting like you, but we can also cast spells. I meditate, and the knowledge of spells enters my mind. One of the spells I can cast right now is a curing spell, and you look like you need it. Spellcasting. You've heard of it, but know nothing about it. You're still cautious, but you watch as the cleric says a few words and touches you lightly on the arm. Magically, your wounds are healed. On your sheet, cross out your hit points and write down eight, the full amount you started with. Feel better, she asks. Would you care to sit and rest a bit? I'd like to tell you a few things that you will need to know later. You sit down, happy to rest, but keeping your sword handy in case of trouble. She sits down next to her lantern. If you didn't know about clerics, you probably didn't know about magic users. They are adventurers like you and me, but they study only spells and rarely fight. They have different spells than we clerics do, and instead of meditating, they learn their spells from books. There are a few magic users living in town, but not many. If you are attacked by a bad magic user, you might be able to avoid the magic, but it's harder than avoiding poison. Spells can be helpful, but they can be very dangerous, too. By the way, that looked like a snake bite that I cured. That can be very bad because most poison is deadly. You were lucky that it didn't cause more damage. Some other creatures also have special attacks like poison. 
Some can paralyze, and some can even turn you to stone by just looking at you, unless you look away in time. And dragons are the worst. They can breathe fire, acid, or other deadly things. You can never avoid all the damage from their breaths, but you can lessen it if you cover up in time. Your character has different saving throws for each of the special attack forms. These will be explained later. Charisma, your personality. Your fighter gets along fairly well with the cleric. She was friendly right away. This is the effect of another ability score, your charisma. Since your fighter is a likable person, your charisma score is above average, 14. Remember, 18 is the best possible. If you had a low score, the cleric would have been very cautious and might not have offered to cure you at all. Wisdom, your common sense. A cleric is very wise. This is another ability score, different from intelligence. For example, imagine that you feel wet drops on your arm. Your intelligence would tell you it's raining. Your wisdom would tell you to go indoors to avoid catching a cold. Your fighter is not very wise. Your wisdom score is 8. The cleric has a wisdom of 17, but is fairly weak with a strength of 9. Each type of adventurer has a different specialty. Magic users, for example, will have high intelligence, but often low strength. Put these two ability scores on your sheet. 8 wisdom, 14 charisma. Sharing okay, adventures. We told us well, well you, you wrote it down. You wrote it down before it told you to write it down. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's out of order. <laughs> yeah. Sharing adventures. As your fighter talks with the cleric, you get to know each other a little better. She offers to come along to help you in the adventure. Although this means that the treasure would be split between you, it also means that together you can defeat more dangerous monsters and find more treasure. And two adventurers have a better chance of success than either does uh, alone. You decide that it would be a good idea, and together you set off down the next corridor. How are you liking this so far? So we're, far, so good. We're on page five. I'm tempted to start my son on basic dungeon dragons. This is a great. How many pages are that? What's that? How many pages are in it? Well, the whole book, that the whole first book is fit sixty-three pages, but there's a, it goes into a lot more detail later. The adventure goes, I think, to page twenty-two. Gotcha. Let's see, because there's two adventures. You're just on the first one. The next one, you actually get more say. It's less railroady. Um, it's more exploratory. You actually have to map and everything. He teaches you mapping. Like, how many starting kits teach you mapping? Which is a really important gaming skill yeah. that, like, nobody knows how to do anymore. And it's really helpful. I mean, you're not always in a dungeon, but even if you're in a city or whatever, being able to map where things are from a description is very useful. My Wednesday game hasn't figured this out yet about actually mapping. Because no, nobody's taught this. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have a man to comment about mapping, and then I'm showing pieces of the map. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in that room, I remove that room from the map. And you have to remember your own We have map. a whole generation that grew up never looking at a map and only using GPS. Yeah. They don't know how to map. It is a necessary survival skill if your GPS isn't working. They don't even know how to read a map, let alone make one. So you have to realize that a whole generation has never looked at a map. Cartography is a lost cause. I mean, lost skill. Yeah, not a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good cause. Bring it back. Side by side, you quietly walk down the dark passageway. You see another corridor branching off to the right, about 20 feet ahead. Keeping your lanterns half shuttered so you can see what you are doing without attracting much attention, you move up to the corridor and peek around the corner. Four beast-like humans in tattered clothes are standing in a group about ten feet away down the corridor. But they make no noise at all, quiet as the dead. They look like they are waiting for some poor victim to come along. I hope those are just zombies. <laughs> Can we be the poor victim? You will be the poor victim. Since we're not doing a large. He volunteers as tribute. I do. <laughs> I accept this volunteer. Mm, I bet we get turned on dead. Oh. <laughs> Are we paladins? I didn't know. If you didn't know what Cleric, cleric was, how do you know what a paladin is? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the other thing paladins don't exist yet. Yeah. Yeah, you don't run into that in the basic set. Because it is basic for a reason. Before you can speak, 
The cleric touches your arm and points back the way you came. The two of you back up a few feet so the creatures won't hear you. They're ghouls, she whispers. If one hits you, it could paralyze you. No. Ghouls are undead dead monsters, very nasty things. Neither dead nor alive, but something horribly in between. We clerics have some power over these creatures of darkness. Follow me and wish for luck. You move forward again, but with the cleric leading the way. Peeking around the corner, you see the ghouls. Luckily, they don't seem to have heard your whispers. The cleric pulls a necklace out from under her armor, and you see that there is a symbol of one of the town churches on her silver chain. She boldly steps out, holds up the symbol, and says harshly, Be gone, vile things! When she steps out, the ghouls quickly turn to attack, but now as she thrusts the symbols out, the ghouls pause, and suddenly, in a rush, they scramble away down the side corridor into the darkness and all in dead silence. Don't bother to chase them, she mutters. As I said, they can be quite dangerous, and we should continue on our way. I was lucky to turn them, and it might not work again. As you continue down the corridor together, she explains, We call this turning undead, you see. Only clerics can do it, and sometimes it doesn't work. Ghouls are only one of many kinds of undead monsters. There are also skeleton zombies and much worse. If you had been alone, you could easily have been ambushed and probably slain. Let's hurry, because the turning only lasts for a few minutes. There are too many of them for us to handle. You see a door ahead, to the right. This is unusual in caves, and you approach it slowly and quietly. The corridor continues past it into the darkness. Together you examine the door. It is made of wood, with heavy iron bands across it. The hinges seem to be on the other side. A large keyhole is below the curved metal handle. I don't see anything dangerous, says the cleric, but then I don't know much about the traps you sometimes find on doors. It's worth a try. She tries to open it, but the door seems to be locked. Could you try to force it open, she asks. You back up a bit and, with a short run, slam into the door. But try as you might, you can't break it open. Oh, what a pity, murmurs Lena. There's probably some nice treasure in there. But we can't get to it. We need a thief. Seeing the puzzled look on your face, she explains. You may think that thieves are bad, but many of them aren't. Thieves are adventurers, too. Some of them are quite nice folks, really. You do have to keep an eye on your coin purse, but a thief can be very helpful finding traps, opening locks, climbing walls, and doing other things. I'm sure we could do better if we had a thief along, and a magic user could help, too. I usually go adventuring with those types, but a couple of big fighters like you, plus a couple of big fighters like you, to handle the rough stuff. Unfortunately, nobody else wanted to come along this time. You try the door again, but it won't open. So, with a sigh of regret, the two of you continue down the corridor. The corridor curves to the left, and you see a light ahead. You stop and listen and hear voices. One sounds like a man, but the other sounds like a goblin. Get up, you wimpy weakling, growls the man. Who else did you see besides the fighter and a cleric? Please, master, don't hurt, whimpers the goblin. Nobody else, nobody. I, I hurt the fighter real bad. I come to tell you right away. The goblin's lies don't seem to fool the human. Get up, I say, or I'll turn you into a toad. You probably ran away without even trying. Nobody else, you sure? Nobody else, master, I swear. Urmph. They could still mean trouble. Perhaps we can trick them and kill them without a fight. Alina taps your arm once again and you back up to discuss the situation. I recognize that man's voice, she says. It's Bargle, one of those bad magic users. He has probably cast a spell on the goblin to force it to serve him. If we go back, we should be safe. Oh, I almost forgot. The ghouls are back there. Bargle only has one goblin. We should risk this battle rather than face all those undead. Besides, he's not ready for us yet. Listening carefully, you hear the magic user and the goblin planning how to trick you and Alina. The two of you also make plans. 
The magic user is the most dangerous, and Alina will try to fight his spells with hers. Your job is to fight the goblin. As you return, you hear a spell being cast up ahead. You peek around the corner and see a tall, bearded human in a black robe standing in a room. A goblin is crouched by one wall, watching. The robed magic user is moving his hands and saying words you don't understand. And suddenly, he disappears. The goblin crackles with glee and says, <laughs> Master, it worked! Nobody can see you now. And what a surprise those nasty people will have. And I'm next. Make me invisible too, Master! The cleric whispers, Now, before they can do any more. And you charge into the room together. The goblin jumps up and meets your charge with a swing of its sword. It misses! The goblin has two hit points. And you still need to roll a 12 or better to hit it. Roll the die and keep track of the battle in the same way as you did with the snake. Six. Miss. Four. Miss. As you battle the goblin, Alina looks wildly around for the invisible magic user, waving her mace to and fro in the air. It seems to hit something, and you hear a deep grunt. Oh. She keeps waving her mace, but without further success, so she stops and casts a spell. You don't see what her spell does, so you concentrate on fighting. The goblin swings back at you and hits your fighter for two hit points of damage. Go ahead and roll an attack. Ah, dudes. Okay. <laughs> Dice. Goblin <laughs> swings back at you and misses. Go ahead and roll your attack. Net 20. All right, you do one hit point of damage to the goblin each. Well, you know, each, each of your own version of the goblin. Yes. Okay. Our it swings at you and misses again. Well, you didn't say. Good attack, yeah. Uh, What'd you get? 19. What'd you, 19. So you knock yours de dead. Yours is still alive. It swings at you and hits you for two hit points. Uh, he's going to kill me first. I know it. And then you swing at it. Ooh. Miss? Miss. Swings at you and misses. Miss. Okay, swings at you and hits for two hit points. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try this die? Yeah, let me switch dice again. Fourteen. <laughs> All right, you hit it for one hit point. It's dead. All right. Ooh. Big difference between the two of you there. <laughs> Alina can't find Bargle and is starting to look worried. Suddenly the sound of a spell comes from a far corner of the room. The cleric turns and runs in that direction, waving her mace and shouting. The black-robed magic user appears in the same corner as the spell noise, with a glowing arrow floating in the air beside him. He points at Alina, the arrow shoots out and hits her. She wails and falls with a sigh, collapsing in the middle of the room. The glowing arrow disappears, actually shows an actual glowing arrow. Is that the first version of Magic Missile? Yep. Yeah. Not first, but for this version. Yeah. Ow! Oh, what that? Great. I'm down to two hit points and the healer is unconscious. Uh, <laughs> I blame you. Why? Where are you at? I, 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 I'm just not giving You're, you Where are you at? at? You're at six, yeah. Well, it's because you're evil, evil Spock. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Bad karma. All right. Uh, if your fighter hasn't slain the goblin yet, roll again. But while you are swinging... Okay, we already did that. Okay. If your hit points reach zero, the enemies win this battle. You will not see home again. If you're still fighting, the magic user stays back in the corner thinking about what spell to throw next. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So this is still, if the goblin's still alive, it's going back and forth, going back and forth. Hold on my dagger. Um, the second time you hit a creature, it's at zero. When you, when you hit him, he shrieks and falls dead on the floor. You've overcome one enemy, but the magic user remains. When the goblin falls, the magic user starts looking worried. Watching you carefully, he starts saying magic words and waving his hands. He's casting a spell at you! You run at him, hoping for a chance to swing before he can complete the spell, but it's too late. A magical force touches your mind. Roll the die once again. You must make a saving throw against the spell. If you roll a 16 or less, the magic takes effect. I'm dead. What'd you get? Three. Six. All right. 
So it says if the if you roll 16 or less, the magic takes effect. Read the next section, ending number one, for this adventure. If you roll 17 or higher, your fighter avoids the spell. Skip to ending number two on page eight. So we're going to ending number one. Yay. Ending number one, you miss the saving throw. As you get near the magic user, a funny feeling comes over you. Why, he doesn't look so bad. In fact, Bargle seems to be a pretty nice guy. You think you used to be friends, but you're not sure just where or when. Feeling better, he asks. You were overcome with rage for a moment. Are you okay now? Sure, you reply, somewhat confused. You seem to be okay, Bargle old pal, and I only took a little damage from that goblin. Say, I saw some ghouls back there. We should get moving. Indeed, replies Bargle. Well, let's pack up the goodies and move on. Together, you collect the treasure. A small bag from the go goblin, loot the body, and a larger one from the cleric. Loot the cleric body. <laughs> Bargle picks up a black velvet bag, explaining that he dropped it while he was fighting the goblin. As you get ready to leave, you blurt out, Shouldn't we take the cleric's body back? She helped me out earlier. That would be nice, Bargle replies, but we're carrying all we can. We all take our risks here in the dungeon. Something seems wrong about that. You argue with Bargle a bit, but he convinces you that nothing could be done for her. And bringing her along could slow you down, maybe enough that the ghouls would catch up. So you head off down the corridor as if the best of friends. The corridor leads to another room, which is empty. You search it together. Nothing can be found. But looking down the next passage, you see a light. Bargle, you exclaim, look here! Ah, I see, he says. That must be a way out. We're in good shape now. Lead on, fierce fighter. I shall watch for the ghouls. You head down the corridor towards the light. Sure enough, it's a side passage leading out of the hill into the sunlight. As your stomach grumbles, you remember that it's afternoon. You miss lunch in all the excitement. Shall we head back, you ask, as you squint out into the daylight much brighter than your lantern? Surely, he replies. As you head outside, you start to talk about how hungry you are. Bargle's reply isn't in a language you can understand. You stop and turn and see him softly chanting a spell, waving his hands at you. Before you can ask what's going on, you begin to feel very sleepy. Everything goes black. Sleep. Something lands on your face, and you start to wake up. Opening your eyes, you see a leaf, apparently fallen from the tree above you. You are lying by a cave, and it's late afternoon. You can make it back to town if you hurry. But suddenly you remember what happened. Bargle! The fight, or fight with the goblin. Alina falling. The strange, bad but nice feeling about the magic user. Horrors! You were enchanted! And where is the treasure? You get up quickly, brushing the leaves off your face and equipment. Perhaps Bargle was afraid to kill you and just stole all that he could find. Or, more likely... Bargle was scared away by something before he could slit your throat. Your dagger is missing. And some food. But your sword is in its sheath and your pack is still there. One sack remains, and from the pain in your back, you must have been sleeping on it. It contains some of the coins you found by the snake and the tiny gem. The rest is missing. You remember what happened to poor Alina. You should take her back to town. They might be able to help, and even if it's too late, you should get a pro she should get a proper burial. As you prepare to return to the caves, you find that your lamp has gone out. The oil all burned away. There is still one oil flask in your pack. So you refill the lantern, light it with your tinderbox, and head back into the dark. See how it's teaching all these little fundamental yeah. basics of adventuring? Right? Just through a narrative. But it's teaching you all the things you need to know for dungeon survival and adventure survival. Um... You pass through one empty room and then find the bodies of the cleric and the goblin the next. But you see dark, quiet shapes in the darkness beyond. It's the ghouls! Quickly, you put the cleric's body over your shoulder and run for your life. The ghouls follow, snapping at your heels. You can't move as fast as usual with the weight of the cleric on your shoulder, but you win the desperate race and get outside once again. You pause for a moment out of breath. Looking back, you see the ghouls in the cave, but they don't seem to be coming out. Then you remember Alina's words. Creatures of darkness. Maybe they hate the sunlight and only come out outside at night. You'd better hurry to get back to town before dark. 
It's hard to run with the cleric across your shoulder, but you finally get back just as the sun goes down. Once there, you take her body to her church. It's too late to help her, but they can, can give her a proper burial. They thank you for your kindness and offer a small bottle as a reward. What is it? you ask. It's a magical potion, of course, he ex exclaims. It's a potion of healing. If you are hurt, you can drink this and be cured somewhat like our magical curing spells. It's a nice magical treasure. Save it for an adventure in your future, in case a cleric you are traveling with runs out of spells. It's the least we can do. The clerics thank you again for your help, and you thank them for theirs. You leave the church and head for your home of, on the other side of town, thinking about your adventure and all you have learned. Now, pretend that you made the saving throw, and read the next section to see what might have happened. If you've already read in the next section, then skip to the winning section afterward. So, how's this for you so far? I like it. Yeah, and again, we're, you know, we're not, we're not even a full hour into this yet. So, ending number two. You make the saving throw. Bargle's magic doesn't seem to work. He pauses, surprised, as you swing. Roll the die. If you roll an eight or higher, you hit, because he's a magic user. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> What'd you get? Twelve. All right, you both hit. Um, if you can get close to them, magic users are often easy to hit. They are not very dangerous in a close fight. If you hit, the magic user gives a cry, ah, and falls dead. You have oh. won. <laughs> they don't have many hit points. No, <laughs> Somewhere between one and four. Four. If you miss, Bargle screams and runs down the next corridor into the darkness. You start after him, but then you stop. Who knows what magical powers the man might have waiting there to trap you. Better to see if Alina is alive and rest a bit. You kneel by the cleric and gently turn her over. Alas, Bargle's magical spell has taken her life. Mourning the loss of your newfound friend, you decide to take her back to town for a proper burial. You tidy her up while keeping an eye out for monsters and listen carefully in case Bargle comes back. But nothing happens. The goblin had very little treasure, just a few copper pieces and a small bag. Searching the room, you find another bag, a, a finer one of black velvet. It must be Bargle's, dropped in the heat of the battle. Excuse me. Opening it, you find several valuable gems and a small bottle. You put the treasure away, planning to examine the bottle later. Nothing else of value is in the room. You pick up the poor cleric and carry her on one shoulder. Should you continue down the dark corridor or head back the way you came? You suddenly see shadowy shapes approaching from the way you came. The ghouls must have returned. Now there is no choice. You must hope that the magic user ran away and that a way out lies in that direction. Fighting the ghouls would mean your death. You stagger under the weight. So, the so, user. What? We must hope the magic is right well, away. this is if you didn't. Yes, Remember, it said if you didn't, if you, if you didn't kill him, he ran away. Ah. Remember, it said that earlier. Okay. Um, so, At keeping that in all. mind that yeah. you know it's not fully threaded in this first adventure. The second one is more mm -hmm. separated. Um, so, it, good thing it teaches here is that it is okay to run away. Right. That you don't just fight everything, and it mentions each time you didn't have to fight. You know, if you could have talked to the goblin and things like that. The snake, okay, kind of a problem, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice that it mentions those you things. You could run away from the snake. Yep. <laughs> you stagger under the weight, but manage to run down the corridor, holding your lantern shakily with one finger. You enter a room, but it looks empty. No time to search. You continue onward. As you head into the next corridor, you see light ahead, and as you approach, you see that it's coming from a side passage. Peering into it, you find that the corridor leads outside into the midday sun. Carefully, in case Bargle is waiting to ambush you, you walk outside. And all is clear and calm. By the way, here's a picture of you over the uh, dead cleric. That's a big bag of treasure. <laughs> I was carrying that and her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you do have a 17 strength. Yeah. I do like that all more artwork. Yeah. He was good. And a nice balance to the style. I like his colors the most. Yeah, yeah, they have really vibrant colors, yeah. Um, you rest a bit, pick up the cleric, and head back to town. Once there, you take her body to her church. It is too late to help her, but they can give her a proper burial. They thank you for your kindness and offer a favor in return. You remember the strange small bottle in Bargle's bag and get it out, asking whether they can tell you what it is. So now it's teaching you about bringing it to be identified. 
One of the clerics opens the bottle and sniffs at it. Why, it seems to be a magical potion, he exclaims. Let me see now. I'm sure I've smelled that before. Ah, I remember. It's a potion of growth. If you drink it, you will become a giant for a short time, for one to two hours, and can do double normal damage when you hit a monster. Congratulations, it's a nice magical treasure. It won't spoil. Save it for an adventure in your future. The clerics thank you again for your help, and you thank them for theirs. You leave the church and head for your home on the other side of town, thinking about your adventure and all you have learned. And then it says if you haven't read any one, go back and read that one. So you right. learn both results. Winning. You have just played a D&D &D game. This adventure was designed to show you some of the basic parts of the game. You played a fighter who tried to survive in the dungeon while finding monsters and treasures. You succeeded, so your character wins. Think a moment. Why do we play games? To have fun. Each player wins by having fun, so if you had a good time, you win. You can have fun even if your character gets killed. And if that happens, don't worry, you can always make up another one! Exclamation mark. Really important, that. Winning a role-playing game is like winning in real life. It's just succeeding in doing what you wanted to do and living through it. The fun comes from doing it, not ending it. This is why we say that in this game, everybody wins and nobody loses. Is this a game or a story, you ask? It's a little of both. As you learn more about it, it will become more and more like a game. You still have many game details to learn, so continue reading. You have met some monsters and won the battles. You have found some treasures, not only coins and gems, but a magical potion. Most important, you have learned how to use your own imagination while using the rules of the game. Could you see in your mind the wicked magic user Bargle? Yep. Riley? Yes. Okay. Or the kind, yeah, wise it. cleric no. Alina? Yeah. Well, Especially with the pictures. Yeah. I was yeah. Gonna say it helps to have... Yeah. Can you imagine the gold and silver scattered on the floor by the huge deadly rattlesnake? Yes. And the fierce battle afterward. This is another part of the fun in a Dungeons and Dragons game. How long does that take us to get through? Um, it is now 7.44, so about one hour from reading the full introduction to playing, and we played our first adventure through, you know, and, solo. And did both... One hour. Both outcomes. Yeah, it did both outcomes. Yeah, exactly. Now, the next one is more flexible. And could take a while longer. Right. But you get to play yourself. And when you're playing by yourself, that, you know, it goes by very, it goes by faster than this, because you can usually read faster. So, now it does take a little bit, it does take a little interjection here before the next adventure to talk about your character and your character sheet. This is optional, but it does suggest. Alignment, how characters and monsters behave. Take a moment now and think about how your character behaved. The fighter was one of the good guys. You wanted to, oh, by the way, in basic DNA, there's only three alignments. Good, evil, and neutral? Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Bad and ugly? Yeah. <laughs> um, you wanted to do the right things. For example, you brought the cleric back home with you. On the other hand, the magic users and the goblin were the bad guys. They didn't care whether you lived or died, just what they could get from you. Selfish and nasty besides. There's a way to describe how your character behaves in the game. It is called alignment. Your fighter's alignment is called lawful. He tries to protect others and defeat monsters. Alina the Cleric was also lawful. This is one reason why you become friends. became friends. Your charisma helped when you first met her. But if your alignments were different, you probably wouldn't have been so friendly to each other. Margle the Magic User had a different alignment than yours. He was chaotic, the opposite of lawful. He was selfish, cared only about himself and steals from others. Most people don't like chaotics. You two wouldn't normally become friends at all, except for the spell he cast that magically forced you to be his friend for a short time. Monsters have alignments, too. The goblin and the ghouls were chaotic, but the snake wasn't really good or bad, although it certainly was dangerous. Its alignment is called neutral. It will fight to protect itself and will help others, if that will help it, but it mostly concern, is mostly concerned with surviving. Neutral doesn't mean stupid. Alignment has nothing to do with intelligence. It means a balance, an average between the law and the chaos. The snake was just a typical animal trying to stay alive and get something to eat. Alignment will be explained in more detail later in the booklet on page 55. So that's more of the more Cockian style of law, chaos, and neutrality. 
Um, it's very basic. It doesn't have all the nuance of all the other versions of D&D, which have the lawful good. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much you're always going to play lawful or neutral. You're not going to usually play chaotic. Now where do you go? You can have more adventures by yourself. Another adventure has been designed just for your fighter. It starts on page 13. But before you play that adventure, you will need to know a few more details about your fighter and how to use all the dice. All the details of your character, your hit points, ability scores, saving throws, and so forth, are written down for you on a sheet in the middle of this booklet, so it gives you a completed character sheet. Um, along with other details. This description of your character is called a character sheet. So you can optionally take the time. So here is a nice, simple, lightweight character sheet. Yep. Right? This is what everybody's trying to recreate. Like, everybody thinks this is a new thing. They have a lightweight system. Think again. Or if you want both sides, there's a short version of both sides of, of the character sheet. That's a complete character sheet. What was uh, the first module? Uh, B1. Uh, in Search of the Unknown? Uh, B2 is Keep the Borderlands. Yeah, I think B1 is In Search of the Unknown. Remember it had the step-by-step -step how to play? Yeah. We, we did that. We used B1 to train the... the uh, yeah, but we used the Advanced Sentence Dragons rules for we it. We did, because we were training them. But we used the... But we had them read, which I've got a whole section on, the 10 important player things to yeah. know to be a good adventurer. Um, and it's not... I have the... Here it is. I just not put away. The one that has both the first and fifth edition versions. Yeah. That's the one I... This is the original, original. Yeah. yeah. They're the same. It's just the original... The version, cover's seven, different. Seven, seven cover, it. Yeah. 79, 81. So this has a great thing that I've read to. There's already a video. You can just look it up. Which is the... Um, what was it? It was in the back. It was this, okay, yeah, it was how to... Um, tips for players. It was uh, 10 tips for players. Be an organized player, keep in mind the DM, cooperate with your fellow players. These are the rules to live by, which I won't go through again, because I already have a whole video where I just did that and commented. But, if you want to look at it. These are basically the code of conduct for playing. All right, so you can now, if you want, take some time to learn the other ability scores, saving throws, adjustments, magic items, normal items, combat chart, etc., and all the other dice. So that takes a couple of pages there, but it's it's only um, let's see, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So four pages, four pages to fill in more of the blanks. We don't need to do that because we know this well enough. We can skip. But, you know, take you a few, take you a few, maybe 15, 20 minutes to read through, depending upon the speed of reader, maybe less. Then uh, we go on to, uh, it also talks about experience points. You got experience points. Um, so jumping to experience on page 12. In the game, your character will become more powerful each time they complete an adventure. The way of measuring this power is another number called experience points. The abbreviation is XP. When your character started, you had no experience points. But in your first adventure, you killed a giant snake and a goblin and found some treasure. You get experience points for each of these things. For the treasure you found, you get 200... Actually, maybe I should go back, because I think it gives you treasure and everything. Where to go? You know, more adventures. Read, read, read. Use a pencil whenever you need to write a character sheet, not pen. Uh, the character sheet, class. Okay, now it talks a little about, about armor class. Character sketch or symbol, ability scores, now I'm on page 10. Adjustments for strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, charisma, saving throws, special abilities, combat chart, turn the sheet over, and then it's money. So magic items, whenever you find a magic item, write it down there. Uh, in this box, write potion of healing, the magic item you found in ending number one, since you probably missed the saving throw against Pargle's spell. <laughs> wow. And you will need the, that... Uh, healing potion of healing in your next adventure anyway. So, you know, potion of healing. 
Um, normal items. This is where you list the equipment that your character has, copy the following list into the box, and look it over so you know what you are carrying. For now, don't worry much about how much the items cost or where they came from. You have a dagger and other normal equipment again, even though Bargle stole some. We will assume that you kept spare equipment at home, but here's the list of your equipment list. Now, is this on the character sheet so I can just make a copy for you guys? It is not. So shall I make you guys character? Actually, I don't need to. I've got a bunch of them right here. Quite character sheets, I think. Oh, they might be in the folder. Here, I'll just quickly copy this because it's okay. got the, the stats already for you. And then you'll be able to do the next one. If you want to. Do you guys want to go to the next one? Or? What do you think? I don't care. You don't you care? another hour, so... <laughs> Your enthusiasm is overwhelming. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I don't know if we're going to make it very far with these rolls, though. What's that? I don't know if we're going to make it very far with these rolls. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of bad. There are no bad players, just bad dice. <laughs> Don't blame the huh. player, blame the game. Really? Really? <laughs> they are not players making really bad choices. I did not choose your roll of one. I'm surprised Hawk doesn't say it. I'm surprised that's not your motto. What? That there's no bad players, there's only bad rolls. Yeah, but you can make plenty of bad choices. Yeah, it's not that's, a bad See, I, I prefer to play. A, it's just a I try to be choice. a good player by avoiding rolls as much as possible because I can't count on the rolls. <laughs> rolls get me killed. Exactly, you're a good player bad dice. Yeah. <laughs> but there are play character players who make really bad choices and they should not have engaged. They're just different choices. Yeah. <laughs> For example, if there's no crits and stuff and that creature has 500 hit points and you have 5, it would be a bad player that does not try to run away. Mm, you honestly have like a really good plan. My plan is to be swallowed and cut my way out. Exactly. <laughs> Obi Dick. Yeah. Jonah. <laughs> All right. What am I gonna do? That's completely conked out. Gosh darn it! You haven't killed your printer already again. No, it's the it's on the screen. It keeps oh. Conked out. That's the cable, not the monitor. But do you see what a difference this is for an actual starter? Mm -hmm. Six HP. Oh, that's a difference. You guys? Huh? You yeah. see what a drastic difference this is from all the other starters out there? Yeah. This is what a starter kit should be. It's actually starting you out from scratch. And it's teaching you in layers of knowledge, slowly layering one upon, so it builds on prior knowledge. This is an effective method of teaching and learning. It's funny how your stats are actually different than what they previously advertised. Yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, you went from 8 to 6 hit points, your strength went from 17 to 16, your intelligence <laughs> went uh, down from 9 to 7, your wisdom went up, up. Went up by 1, Yay. your dexterity went up by 2, your constitution... This is another fighter. Oh, it's a different fighter. No, it's not, but yeah, I know it's different. Oh, well. The resume is now 8. Oh, yeah. Alright, your equipment list. Here's the equipment you want to write down. Put that on equipment. Normal, normal items, items. yep. Yeah. Two flasks of oil. There's about 10 items here, 12 or so. Two flasks of oil. One tinderbox. One rope 50 feet. One leather backpack. One standard rations preserved food. So that's one day? Yep. You are only lowly. And we're staying close to home. Yep. One water skin leather canteen. One lantern, 
two torches, two small sacks, one large sack, one suit of chainmail armor, one shield, one dagger, one sword. There is a way to help you remember who your character has met and where you have gone. You should write down Caves Near Town, Met Bargle, Chaotic Magic User. This is under other notes. Yeah. Cave Near Town, Met Bargle, Chaotic Magic User. Make more notes as you play more adventures. See, it's teaching you all these fundamental basic skills. Some of these are soft skills as opposed to the hard skills. Money and treasure. You found many gold and silver pieces when you killed the giant snake and a few copper pieces when you killed the goblin. You brought home a little of each, though Bargle stole most of it. This is where you make a note of the treasure you have, adding to the list for any more treasure you find. We use abbreviations for the types of coin listed here in order, starting with the most valuable. PP for platinum pieces, GP for gold pieces, EP for electrum pieces, SP for silver pieces, and CP for copper pieces. Yeah, it's got that in the lower left, okay. These abbreviations are often used, so you should get to know them well. To write down the treasure you found, copy this into the money box on your character sheet. So PP7, GP50, EP20, SP40, CP100, one gem worth 100 gold pieces. Total value 200 gold pieces. To find the total value 200 gold pieces, you need to know more about the D&D money system. Think of a copper as pennies, silver as dimes, and gold as dollars. Electrum pieces are like half dollars, but platinum is expensive. One platinum piece is like a five dollar bill. Study the money conversion table on this page. It's got a little conversion chart, very simple. Cool. When you find treasure in an adventure, write it down on a separate piece of paper. At the end of the adventure, add the treasure to your list and figure out your new total. In your adventures, look for the most valuable treasure. If you're carrying all you can, you may have to drop some treasure to pick up more valuable coins. Drop copper first, of course. Experience. In the game, your character will become more powerful each time you complete an adventure. The way of measuring this power is another number called experience points, the abbreviations XP. When your character started, you had no experience points, but in your first adventure, you killed a giant snake and a goblin and found some treasure. You get experience points for each of these things. For the treasure you found, you get 200 XP, one experience point per gold piece value. This is, this is something I don't totally agree with, right. but it's the way D&D was. Almost all your experience points were through killing and treasure and nothing else. The GM could always award stuff, but mechanically, all they said was treasure, pro treasure value, and killing. That was the only way to advance. I like to do lots of bonus XP for good role playing, and over time, de emphasize the. I rarely use the treasure, like I would do like one tenth the treasure value or something, um, and really de emphasize the, the killing part of it over time. But we're doing it as written, so that's that's a fundamental difference here. It's very simple. I mean, it's it's tangible and understandable, but it has, uh, you know, certain play consequences and play style. Uh, for killing the monsters, you get 30 more. That adds to 230 XP, but it's not your total. You also get a bonus because you are a fighter and have an above-average strength score. This bonus is plus 10% of your XP. Since you earn 230, you get 23 bonus points for a total of 253 XP. Isn't it nice that it walks you through the math? In the experience point, experience box at the bottom of the page, write 253. Did you notice that you get a lot of experience for treasure and not much for killing monsters? It's better to avoid killing if you can by tricking monsters or using magic to calm them down. I've got that highlighted. That is one nice feature that they do, is they want you to focus on the treasure rather than the killing. So, materialism rather than murder. Okay. It's a gray area. You can sometimes avoid the risks of combat, but you will have to fight many monsters to get their treasures. Remember your level at the top of the front of your sheet? That relates to XP experience points in the following way. If you gain enough experience points, your level goes up. When your level goes up, you become more powerful. 
Each time this happens, you will get more hit points. Sometimes, but not every time, when your level goes up, your character will be able to make saving throws a little easier and hit things a little more often. So the more levels you gain, the longer you can survive, and the more treasures you can collect. On the line at the bottom of the experience box, write the number 2,000. This is your goal. When you finally have this many XP, adding up your points from each and every adventure, your character will no longer be level 1. You will move up in power to level 2. That doesn't mean that you lose any XP, you will keep adding more as you get them. You will probably work your way up to level 3, 4, 5, and so forth, becoming more powerful each time. And human characters can go all the way to 36 level, though this should take hundreds of games. For low level, your goal doubles for each level. 4,000 for third level, 8,000 for fourth level, and so forth. It's pretty straightforward. Now, you should know how to use each part of your character sheet. If you didn't understand something, stop. Go back and read the details again. You will have a character sheet for each character you play. If you have all the details you need to play the character properly, uh, it will have all the details you need to play. Okay. Dice. Then they go through the different types of dice and how to roll, percentile, d8, etc. We are not do that. Solo adventure. So that's 8.03 p.m. You have the potion of healing. That's the one it said for you to have for the next adventure. In the following one player adventure, you will explore a dungeon looking for monsters and treasures. Part 1 is a shopping trip in town. In Part 2, you will learn more about battles. And in Part 3, you will visit the dungeon. You will often be given choices and asked to pick one. Each choice gives a number. Turn to that number to find the results of your choice. Your adventure will continue from there. So, now it's much more flexible. It's still a little railroady, but a lot less now um, within that context. So, Part 1, Town Business. You spend a few days in town letting your wounds heal. Since you found so much treasure on your first adventure, you go shopping for some better armor. Armorer Baldwick knows you very well. He's a jolly fellow getting a bit gray. You remember snitching apples from the big tree in his yard when you were young and foolish. Well, well, he booms as you enter his shop. How are you been? How have you been these days? All grown up now, I see. You chat for a few minutes about your younger days, and then you ask if he has any armor that would fit you. Why, surely. Let me see. Let me see. He pushes his way through racks of armor of all kinds as you follow closely behind. There are dozens of sets of armor for people of all sizes, but most of them need repair. Aha! he exclaims, pulling an armload of metal down. Try this on! The armor you are wearing is made of round chain links, all skillfully interwoven to form a covering for most of your body. But this armor is different. Large pieces of well-crafted metal are fastened to chain mail and leather, fashioned into pieces that you could wear. Plate mail, of course. Just finished it a week or two ago. Want to try it on? I think it'll fit. Chook. You go back to a room and remove your chainmail and try this heavier armor on for size. Sure enough, it fits, almost as if it were made just for you. The metal plates hang from leather straps and chainmail links, forming a tough protective suit. But it is very heavy, almost twice as heavy as your chainmail. You come out to show him, and he walks around you, carrying a piece of charcoal and marking the armor here and there for some necessary adjustments. Your armor tailor. Yeah. <laughs> Looks good, he exclaims. Just a bit here and a bit there. Want to trade in that chainmail you had on? Look to be in pretty good shape. Wait a minute, you reply. Don't you have anything lighter than this stuff? I'm not going to be able to carry as much treasure if I wear all this metal. Ah, well, he says soothingly. If you want better protection, you have to use this. Less, of course, you can somehow find magical armor. Plate mail will improve your armor class to AC2 better than your current AC4. So, it would be nice to have. Well, how much, you ask? Well, 75 gold pieces as is. Want to trade in that chain mail, he repeats. Oh, I guess so, you reply. How much? For you, well, since you're trying to get started and since I've known you so long, 50 gold pieces with your trade-in. 
You talk with him a bit more, using your charisma, and bargain him down to a better price. Okay, okay, he says finally. Just 30 gold pieces with the trade-in, and you promise to come here first the next time you need better armor or more weapons. Agreed? Great. He stomps off, grumbling, then stops and turns. You can pick it up Tuesday. Pay the clerk on your way out. <laughs> Subtract 30 gold pieces worth of coins from the money on your character sheet. You can either subtract it from your GP or use some coins of lesser value if you understand the conversion table. Change the numbers on your sheet to account for your spending and exchange your equipment list. And change your equipment list. Then turn the sheet over and change your armor class to 2. So our armor class before was 3. Yep. And you brought it down a point. Okay. Well, he said it was a 4. But yeah. It was a 4 with, well that's without a shield. Oh, it was a 4 sorry. without a shield. Oh, so we can bring it down to a one with a shield. With a shield it'll probably yeah, it would come down to a one probably. Okay. That's, okay. Uh you come back to the shop in a few days, pick up your heavy let's see what's your decks. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to double check those things, but uh come back a few days, pick up your heavy plate mail. It's not ready on Tuesday, but you have time to wait. You spend the time looking around for other adventurers, any help would be welcome. But the few you find all just want to relax, have a good time, and heal up from their last adventures. So, fully equipped but still alone, you set off one morning for the caves near town, remembering to watch out for ghouls. Part 2. Battles. What's that? No, you've got your armor now. You just had to wait a little longer, that's all. You are almost ready to enter the dungeon, but first you need to learn a little more about battles. You already know how to swing at a monster. Roll a 1d20, a 20-sided die, and compare the result to the hit roll given in the description. If you rolled that number or higher, you hit the enemy and roll damage. More damage. In your first adventure, each time you hit a monster, you did one point of damage. However, from now on, you will roll 1d6, a 6-sided die, to see how much damage you do to the creature you are fighting. You will keep track of the damage in the same way, writing down the starting number and subtracting the damage each time you hit. Just cross off the old number of hit points and write down the new number. So, don't erase, cross off. The monsters. Monsters will also be able to do more damage. In your one-player games, you will keep track of their damage on a separate sheet of paper along with your own. In group games, the dungeon master keeps track of all the monster details. Some monsters do 1 to 6 points of damage just as you do, but sometimes they do more or less than 1d6. Each time you encounter a monster, the information you need will be given in a box like this. Goblin, 17, D, 1d6, U, 12, HP, 4. Uh, the number after the monster's name is the roll it needs to hit your fighter. So it says Goblin 17, that's what the goblin has to roll to hit the fighter. This is just an example. D is the dice to roll after the monster hits to find the amount of damage it did to you. Uh, the monster's hit points are also given. In this example, if you roll, and then it says you, 12. So if you roll a 12 or higher, you'll hit the goblin. You then roll 1d6, the standard amount, and add 2 for your strength bonus. So you get a plus 2 strength bonus. You subtract that total from the goblin's 4 hit points as given above. If the goblin's new total is zero or less, the creature is dead. If the goblin still has any hit points left, it swings at you. If you roll a 17 or higher for the goblin's attack, he hits you for one to six points of damage, as noted in this box above. If you roll a six-sided die and subtract the result from your eight hit points. Okay. Combat checklist. A step-by-step -step list of everything you need to do. Yes? Can we start with eight hit points There are some discrepancies, aren't there? Multiple. You're right. That is that is a that is a problem that it doesn't Especially sync up. Some of the characters. Because it keeps referencing and then it doesn't sync up. Yeah. And I wonder what happens there. Yeah, as a fighter, we are going to die in the first hit. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what that's about. I, that. I wonder why they did it differently. I would be okay with it if we had an AC of one instead of two. Well, I mean, it, 17 to hit is still pretty high. Yeah, but that extra oomph would maybe stop her having to. Well, and it just said. What is 
wasn't saying about yours. Let me go back through. Yeah. Um, Notice they're not seeing FACO. Right, no, that's not till second edition. Yep, I don't know if I did. Did armor class zero. So, um, 19 is the FACO. Which really confused a lot of people. Okay, FACO, gotcha. Hmm? I'm going to be FACO. Armor class zero. They replaced with zero. Gotcha. So, fact. Oh, zero. Okay. Good fact. So, yeah, there's definitely a big discrepancy between that sample character sheet and what it describes in all the text. Because yeah. it says your intelligence is average. I wonder why. The intelligence is really dropped. So, that average. was definitely a mistake, I think. I think that's a bug. I think it's definitely about these. You're cut. You're cut. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah, they're all the numbers are fine. Yeah, they're way off. All right, go ahead and go with the eight hit points. Here's the stats for your ability scores Strength 17. Intelligence is nine. Yep, intelligence nine. Wisdom eight. Dexterity 11. Constitution 16. Charisma 14. And that's on page nine that it lists all of that out. So, I don't know why it's so different. So, that's, that's a glitch in this. Yeah. Um, and it does say uh, your fighter's wearing sturdy armor, you get arm class 4, write that number in the shield shape, so it's supposed to be 4, not 3, but with the plate mail, you, it becomes a 2. Mm -hmm. And is that with shield? I think that's with shield. I yeah. think that 3 is a mistake. Mm -hmm. So, I wonder... I wonder if there's an errata for that that fixes that character sheet. Too bad it's not in Beckme. Right, there's no there's no beginning adventures yeah. in Beckme in, in a in the cycle in the so so here's a flaw with this is that they this is inconsistent. Easy to fix, but an unfortunate flaw. But the rest of it so far still it's walking you through the whole process, going to the town, getting equipment, haggling. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff being worked out, it's teaching all the, the 101 stuff that you need as an adventurer. All right. Um, combat checklist. A step-by-step -step list of everything you need to know when fighting a monster is given on the same page as the monster description, the boxed information. Use this checklist for every battle to be sure you're running each one correctly. Record keeping. Use a piece of scrap paper to keep track of the battles. Whenever you find some treasure, write down the amount and type on the same paper. Experience points will begin at the end of the adventure, but you will need a list of the creatures your fighter conquers. All the points for treasure and experience will be added up at the end of the adventure. Getting killed. If your character is slain by the monsters, that is the end of the adventure. But it's not the end of the game. You can start the fighter over again and pretending that it was a new character. If you play this adventure a second time, do not keep any treasure found before you got killed. You should start the character over again from the beginning. Remember that you are carrying a magic potion of healing. If you get hurt, you can drink it and it will cure all your damage. You can then change your hit points back to eight. You can only drink it once and then it's gone. You may drink the potion whenever you wish, but you should wait until you have only two or three hit points left if possible. If you drink it in the middle of a battle, you must skip your attack. You are drinking, not swinging. And roll only for the monster's attack for that round of combat. Things to remember. Keep a record of the monsters killed and treasures found using a separate piece of paper. That's number one. Number two, use the combat checklist whenever you have a battle. Number three, roll 1d6 each time you hit to find out the amount of damage done. Number four, drink your potion when you are badly hurt. Mapping. We're on page 14 so far. Have you seen the combat checklist? It, um, it, it says it's in context each time you have to fight. Oh, so we, we're not... We don't it'll tell you with each... Crew, it, so it'll tell you each time... Well, because everything's printed out in front of you anyway. Right. Right? You're normally... It's normally you by yourself going through this. Um, yes. Which is faster, by the way, than me reading to you. It goes by a lot faster by yourself. Um, mapping. 
This time you will make a map of the dungeon so you don't get lost. Maps also help in remembering where the worst monsters were, like the ghouls, so you can avoid them until you feel ready for them. You will draw your map on a piece of graph paper. Each line one square long will equal 10 feet in the dungeon. Copy each map carefully. Draw an arrow pointing to the top of the paper and label it north. Then draw a line across the arrow and label east, south, and west. This will help you remember the directions. As you draw your maps, be sure to write notes on it to help you, you remind you of where things are. If you don't make a map as you go, you will probably get confused. So that's a little example. That's what a map looks like. Right, and it's, these are the segments that you're going to be drawing as you go. One of my hardest things about being a dungeon master was not drawing the maps for them. So yep. they, they wanted to make yep. sure they're accurate. No. Exactly. <laughs> So as we come to those, you'll be able to flip to the page to draw it. Okay. To draw the segment you need. Don't don't look ahead otherwise, but mm, it's there for your reference. <laughs> All right, page 15, part three, Into the Caves. Since you explored some of the caves earlier, you find yet another entrance to venture into this time. After finding a suitable cave, you pause to be sure you are ready. The caves are dark and dreary. As you remember from last time, so you get out your lantern and light the wick using your tinderbox. Then carefully you step into the first room. Tear the sheet of graph paper out of the center of this booklet, because this does come with graph paper, by the way. That's a cool thing. See? Yep. That's cool. Everything you need. Um, and center of this booklet, then start near the bottom. Copy entry one map. So you see that on there? Entry one map right in the middle. Yep. Bottom, that's entry one map. So copy that square for square. What's the scale? It, it told you 10 feet per square. It said that one during the mapping section. That's the standard for basic was mm. 10 feet per square. And AD&D. &D. Yeah. They didn't go to 5 foot till 3rd edition. That's when they were dealing with miniatures. Yeah. Well, we started with miniatures in OD&D, &D, but it was still 10 feet then. Well, the miniatures were smaller. True, which was what I mostly have, <laughs> the smaller miniatures. <laughs> mostly lead. I'm mad, I tell you! <laughs> you lead poisoning. What's that? Try not to chew on them. Yeah, no, right. Great taste. Yeah. <laughs> Leaded and unleaded. Can you put some lead paint on it, too? Yeah, there you no, go. You it's sealed it. with paint. Yeah. Lead paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Cadmium and such. Because it glow in the dark, right? <laughs> Let me know when you're done with your mapping. Okay, I'm done. I'll have to Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing, Riley? I was drawing the balls. Well, I told you to write at the bottom of the page. You, did you start at the you bottom? Should, you know, he started in the middle, so he has nowhere what? to go. That's a great idea. I can go around the page. Way to not listen to directions. Thank you. I try. You're my hero. It <laughs> says, so starting near the bottom, copy entry map one. That's relatively near the bottom. It's okay. the center. <laughs> Which is relative to... Fails to follow directions. Oh. All right, number one. The room you are in is 50 feet square with 10 foot wide exits in the middle of the north, south, east, and west walls. The ceiling of the room is 15 feet up, but the corridors are only 10 feet tall. The walls, floor, and ceiling are made of rough rock. There are some cracks and crevices in the rock walls, all very small. Standing in the exact center of the room is a stone statue of a woman in armor. You examine it carefully, and finally even touch it, but it is merely a statue, nothing magical or special. You have entered this fifty-foot square room by the southern corridor, which leads out to fresh air and sunlight. The other corridors are dark. The light from your lamp helps, but shadows linger in the corners of this large room. Do you want to stop and listen? 
Search the room or go down a corridor. I'm torn between stop and listen and search the room. I'm going to search the room. Search the room. Search the room. Read 57. So we jump ahead on page. You guys don't need to. <laughs> Only do it if you need it for the map. Okay. We're just doing it for the map, that's all. Because we'll, we'll share with everybody else. So we're jumping to 57. That's on page 18. You search the room carefully, and you find a small scrap of paper in a niche, small hole in one wall. Opening it, you discover a note written on in the common tongue. Rats east, goblins north, beware west. Do you want me to say that again? Rats, goblins. Rats east, goblins north, beware west. Beware. Got it? We can take on some bees. What? We can take on some bees. Yeah. <laughs> you can also see parts of the corridors leading out of the room, which look like entry 57 map. Find nothing else in the room to return to. So entry 57 map is on page 18, bottom right hand corner. Page 18, bottom right hand corner. Thanks, Paige. Yeah, so you now so you can see a little bit down the corridors now. Alright, so And we're only gonna do this part way and then we're gonna jump to the GM one just to make the point. Because yep. this this takes a while because it's a full little dungeon. Okay. You find nothing else in the room, return to one. All right, so we're back at one. Do you want to stop and listen, search the room, or go down a corridor? Uh, stop and listen. Stop and listen. Stop and listen? Sure. Jump to 42. You stop and listen, and hear squeaking noises to the east. Right. Go back to one. So your last option, go down a corridor. Do you want to fight rabbins, rats, goblins, or find out the beware is? I do want to be wary, but I probably shouldn't. So it says, go down a corridor, read 58. So I jumped 58. 58 says, from this room, you can go many ways. Do you want to go east, west, north, or south? <laughs> we just leave. Right. We go west. We can, we can, <laughs> it's we can, giving you freedom of choice. We can, run, we can run away instead of attacking. Do you want to see what, if you go south says, because it is a different option. Yeah, what does south say? Just Two. You are back outside. If you want to go back inside, read number one. If you want to quit, stop reading here. Your fighter goes back to town. If you killed any monsters or found any treasure, read 88 to find how many experience you have earned. If you want to go shopping for supplies, read 89. So it's just giving you that flexibility to come back in here. Eventually we have to leave. Yep. So east, west, or north? Let's go west. We can always run away. I want to go west, yeah. All right, west, because okay. wherever it says there's danger, beware. 43. All right, the corridor goes 20 feet to the west and opens into a room which looks like entry map 43. So, so flip back to page 17, bottom left-hand corner of page 17 is entry map 43 map. Add it to your map. The room is empty except for a few small piles of reddish dust. Do you want to go back or continue? Reddish dust. Okay, there's no examining the dust, so we'll just continue. Continue. Read 45. You go into the room, see, because it's coming into the room. You go into the room and look around. There's nothing here but the reddish dust. When you look closely at the dust, however, you realize that it's rust. You hear a snort. And when you look up, you see a strange-looking creature coming into the room from the western no. corridor. It looks like a giant armadillo with a long tail and has two feathery feelers on the front. It charges at you. Do you want to talk to it, run away, or fight? Run away. Riley? You, you can choose a different choice. No, I don't want to fight. Okay. You want to talk to it? No, I'm going to run away. You don't want to see what finds out what happens if you try to talk to it? <laughs> it's not going to... Uh, can I find out what would, would have happened? I don't want to do it. You want to see? You just want to cheat and find out? Yeah. All right. Since we're rushing through this. So if you wanted to talk to it, go to 12. Talking to the creature doesn't do any good. It attacks and gets one free swing while you were talking. Read 86 and run the battle normally after giving the monster one free attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but still. Uh, so run away or fight? 
Run away. Run away. It's Raid. a rust monster. Yes, it is a rust monster. <laughs> that, unfortunately, is meta. <laughs> yes. 56, as you turn to run away, the monster quickly attacks and gets in your way. You cannot retreat. No. Read 86. Ah. It's too fast for you. So jump to 86. So 86 has a little combat table. It says Rust Monster 13, Damage Rust, U15, HP15. It's page 21, number 86. Use the checklist to be sure that you are running the battle correctly. If the Rust Monster hits you, there's a combat checklist right above it. Yep, I see it. Uh, it does no damage at all. Instead, it makes metal turn to rust. As you run the battle, use the following notes to find the effects of each hit. If you decide to run away, the monster gets one free attack, but only needs a hit to hit a roll nine or better. You can run away after that, but you can only run either east, back to the statue room, or west. If you run east, read one. If you go west, read 28. You guys said run away, right? Yeah. yeah. So do you want to run east or west? You want to go back east and go face the goblins, or you want to go deeper into the dungeon? You want to face the rats. You want to face the rats? I mean, that seems easier than facing goblins. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna run east. Or you can go west and see what's going on there. Ooh, Just run past the rest monster. Babies. I don't know. I'm gonna odd even. Sure. Even. We're going back to the rats. All right. So you run back to one. Same description. Yeah. And now you're gonna go to the rats. To the okay. To the rats. All right. Well, anyway, you guys get the, get the idea. No. We run through the combat, etc. And this will take a while. You will have a, probably a few hours of fun playing through this dungeon yourself and getting equipment and everything, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll get pretty familiar with the system at that point. So, once you've done that, you then also ask your other friends to play through that player's manual while you prep as a dungeon master. Oh, wait. How much do you have to prep? Well, it does say... Read through this, but you don't have to because of the way it's written. That's the key thing. Yes, it's great to prep ahead. It'll make you that much more competent. But the way it's written, you can actually do it as you go. So the introduction to the DM's Guide, you know, the, first, first, the very first in, inner page is a dungeon ma mapping key. So you can read maps and make them. Right. All the standard symbols. You don't see those. They don't even see those in the books anymore. Because you don't see. They don't really push mapping they, well, anymore. Even, even with the maps yeah. that they give for the DM to yeah. use, yeah. they don't give them a key. Yeah, you're just supposed to somehow yep. know that yep. that's that means. Yep. All right. Then it's got a good detailed table of contents. Then it's got terms and abbreviations on page two and the dungeon master's job, the DM's roles. Then page three. Um, reactions. When an encounter begins, you may find the actions of monsters by making reaction rolls. Uh, then running the game. During most of the D&D game, the Dungeon Master leaves the decisions to the players. The DM presents the settings, describing with character C, offering choices of action and so forth. But the course of the game is determined by the actions of the party as decided by all the players. The DM can almost relax and enjoy the character's progress as they explore, making maps, solving puzzles, and so forth. The DM usually deals with the characters as a group rather than the individuals. However, when an encounter begins, a change occurs. The DM takes a more active role, becoming more aware of the actions of each character. The players have a more limited choice of actions as they confront a monster or NPC. The DM plays the roles of each of the creatures encountered and decides their actions while considering those of the characters. Game time passes in slow motion as the DM carefully considers the round-by-round -round action, 10 seconds at a time, and announces the results. An experienced dungeon master can play the roles of several monsters at once, it can be very hard to do this fairly without favoring the monsters or the characters. Just as players should keep player knowledge and character knowledge separate, so should the DM keep the monster knowledge completely separate from the DM information. This challenging task is further complicated by the need to keep the game running smoothly at the same time. The following checklist can be used to make sure that everything is handled smoothly during normal play, order of events in a game turn, during an encounter, order of events in an encounter, and during an encounter that results in combat, order of events in combat. You may concentrate on the roles of the monsters using these lists as reminders of the necessary game mechanics. Just boom, 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 walks you through. Here's your checklist. So this is on page three, order of events in uh, an encounter, order of events in a game turn, order of events in combat. Do you want me to read that or shall I jump to the first game? Jump to the first game. Okay. So page four, only page four out of 48 on this one. Your first game. 
The following adventure is designed for use by a beginning dungeon master. It will tell you what to say to the players, when and what to roll, and includes page references for additional information. Now it does say, before you start, you should look through the rest of this booklet to see what information is given. Uh, procedures and rules on page 1421 give details on handling most situations. Retainers should not be needed if there are four or more players, but it's so say to help flesh out your right. group and such. Uh, but if you use them, be sure they're properly handled. Page 20, the order of events checklist will be helpful during the game. Monsters and treasure are explained afterwards in separate sections. All the details on the monsters and treasures found in this adventure are fully explained here, and you will not need to refer to those sections. Before you start the game, make sure all the pre-game details have been handled using the pre-game checklist. Do all the players know how to play? So have they gone through at least one of the solo adventures? Have they played the solo adventure in the player's manual? Number two, have you read this book up to this point? Have you looked through the rest of this book? It doesn't tell you have to read it. Just you kind of, you've looked through to see what's there. Right. It's not saying you have to learn it all, like all the others say. Just kind of know where to find things. Number three. The Dungeon Master's Handbook, just to point out, is much thinner. Yeah, it's 48 pages instead of 64. Yeah. So it's, it's one-third smaller. Um, do you and the players know the who, what, when, where of the adventure? Well, you'll get that as you read. Are all the characters ready to go, including their equipment? Have the players chosen a caller and a mapper? So somewhere we must have missed a description for a caller and a mapper. I wonder if that yes, was... That's the description right there. I wonder if that's in the player's manual. No, I think it's in the player's manual. Okay. Because by that point, people are probably going to make their own characters. Making up a new character, exchange ability scores... I the chart. That, in, um, that they used to be the thing that players on characters how to prepare. Mapper and caller, page 53. Although each person will be playing the role of a character, the players should also handle the call of mapping and calling. Any of the players can be a mapper or a caller, whatever their characters may be. The mapper is a player who draws a map of the dungeon as explored. One or more of the characters should be making maps, but one of the players must make the actual game map. The map should be kept out on the table for all to see and refer to. Uh, the caller is a player who announces to the DM what the group of characters the party is doing. The caller must check with every player to find out what all this is. This is the way you just keep it really organized that way. They're not necessarily the leader. It's just to figure out. And then they have a, their first job is to find out the party order, the way the characters are lined up and grouped during the moment. So they offload that from the GM. They have the caller handle all that. Um, so who is your character? Why are you going? Where are you going? When are you going? And what are you going to do? Are they who, when, etc. of your characters. All right. Number five. Have the okay. Uh, have uh, they chosen a color and a mapper? Do they have a piece of graph paper and a pencil to map with? If your answer is no, stop and fix the problem. In this adventure, you will find many sections to be read to the players. Listen to them while you are reading. They contain information for you. So while you're reading aloud, pay attention. It's not saying you get a pre-read. Just pay attention as you're reading. Whenever you find a paragraph that starts with DM colon, it contains information for you only. Stop for a minute and read it. The DM information contains instructions on how to run the coming encounter or how to handle a new situation. All right, it's 835. We have a little bit of time. So you notice the gray areas are things I read aloud as a GM. Right. And then the rest I read to myself and may have to summarize and such. But it's really helpful to have those boxes. Now, gray, black text on gray is bad for dyslexia and other things. It's better just to have a box around it. But at least it's clearly highlighted as far as which is which. Adventure record sheet. Using a blank piece of scratch paper, make a list of the details you will need during the adventure. Near the top of the page, write the name of each character, making a list. So now they're telling you how to do a roster. Uh, to the right of each name, write the class of the character. To the right of the class, write the armor class of the character. Ask the caller for the party's marching order. The characters would normally travel in single file or in pairs. Write the marching order below the character list using initials, and note which end is the front to avoid confusion. The rest of the sheet, yep, the rest of the sheet may be used for keeping track of time, the details of monsters encountered, treasure found, and any other notes you wish to make. When you are ready, turn the page and start reading, following the instructions given. Group adventure. Start. Read the following to the players. You guys ready? Yep. 
Yeah. All right. Two fighters about to get killed. <laughs> Many years ago, this part of the realm of man was ruled by a magic user named Gygar. Hmm, where did you get that name from? <laughs> a man of great and mysterious powers. He ruled the lands from his mighty castle, Mistamir, located at the foot of the mountains to the north. Gygar died along, after a long and peaceful rule, but no successor was named. After the years, the unclaimed castle fell into ruin. Now, centuries later, the outline of the broken towers can still be seen from the town, even beckoning, ever beckoning to seekers of danger, fame, and fortune. You have gathered around a dinner table in the Gold Dragon Inn in the center of town. That's famous, huh? Yeah. Uh, filled with ruddy-faced townsfolk and other adventurers who are eating, drinking, laughing, and having a splendid time. You have all heard the tales told by others, tales of monsters lurking within the ruins and guarding rich treasures. None of you have been there, but after an evening of discussion, you decide to, track your, to try your luck in the castle ruin and plan to meet at dawn for the short journey. One special note. The town rulers have offered a reward of 1,000 gold pieces for the capture of Bargol, the renegade magic user. The death of Alina. The death of Alina, a well-known cleric, was the last straw. They want to stop this danger once and for all, so keep your eyes open. Keep your laser handy. <laughs> DM. Stop. Now, again, I wouldn't... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you're keeping laser handy, yeah. So I'm going to read aloud because it's for the benefit of everybody. But now it says, DM, stop a moment and make sure that all the characters are ready to go, then continue reading. Are you guys ready to go? Got all your equipment ready? <laughs> Cock your crossbow. Yeah. <laughs> yes, call me righty. All right. It's morning, and you're off to the castle. It lies only three miles from town just a healthy walk past a local farmer's fields. As you follow the dirt road past the farm, you greet the workers tending the crops. It's a lovely summer's day and all seems peaceful. The landowner himself sits atop a wagon watching his men and chats with you before you continue onward. He mentions that he has had no problems with monsters and if any lurk in the nearby ruins, they stay there like respectable monsters should. Every night, however, he carefully locks up all his animals. After bidding him a good day, you continue toward the ruin. As you approach, you see that the walls are jagged and full of small holes, and a few large stone blocks have tumbled to the earth, lying scattered around the ruins. A gateway in the center of the front wall stands empty, and the massive outer doors now lay rotting nearby. This gateway seems to be the easiest entrance through the wall. A ten-foot-wide gaping hole is in the wall off to your left, and could be another entrance. You do not see any other entrances. The rest of the wall is crumbling, but few wide hole, well, holes have opened. This outer area has no other interesting features. A sheer cliff, the face of a mountain, rises at the north edge of the ruins. DM, now read the next section to yourself and then continue with number one. DM information. Find number one on page 13, or the map of, on page 13. That is the location of the characters at this point. They have approached from the south, and you guys, if you want to, go ahead and follow, just because it's, you know, sharing with you guys. So page four is where I am right now. They've approached from the south, from the bottom, and it's page 13 is where the map is, uh, heading north toward the top of the page. So that, that's something that seems to be from a previous all, edition. All the additional, uh, the, the basic D&D books, this is the only one that had a starting adventure in it, right? Right. As far as I know, only Frank Metzer version did this. Right. The others had Keep of the Borderlands. Right. Or, um... Which, Keep actually, I think Keep of the Borderlands... Or, yeah, no, I think Keep of the Borderlands was bundled with the others, yeah. Like, yeah. in the box, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a different, different approach. So, yeah, you've got this map here. Page, uh, 13. So... That, and that's a good, you know, useful map to figure out where what they want to start and such. All right. One square is ten feet. Assume that the walk from town took about an hour, 
And at the time is now 8 a.m., partly because you sat and talked to the guy for a while. Mm -hmm. Note that, note this near the top of your adventure record sheet. So this is the DM of the adventure record sheet, my roster. And keep track of the passage of game time from now until the adventure ends. So it's now 8 a.m. on my roster. The hit roll charts and saving throws that you will need during the adventure are given here for your convenience. So it's got a nice little cross-reference between armor class and hit dice up to four. And it's got a little chart for saving throws. So just a little chart summarized to be handy. Again, it gives you the information as you need it. So then uh, number one is where the, the doors are. Read the following. The path through the rubble passes the fallen doors. As you carefully approach, you notice some slight movement beneath it. You stop, wary of danger. DM. Encourage the players to send someone forward to examine the door. So do one of you send somebody to look at the door? I'll send the other one. <laughs> the, uh, well, we, have, we have a minion. Oh, the goblin would capture the last one. Uh, but he would kill him. They should do so to be sure their path will be safe. If they don't investigate now, a hidden monster could surprise the party as they pass by. The following encounter is a warm-up for both you and the players to practice playing in a group. Find out which characters are examining the door closely and which are keeping watch for other dangers that we don't. So what, who's doing what? I will examine the door. Okay. And he will he also watch. examine the door. You'll both examine the door. Both examine the door. Okay. Suddenly the ground along one edge moves and a hole appears. There's something under the door. If the character is closely examining the door, select a fighter or dwarf if possible, or randomly pick a character to be the victim of the coming attack. Do not tell the players what you have done. Ask the players, one by one, and starting with the victim you have chosen, what their characters intend to do. Remember what they say and make notes if you wish. So what are you going to do? I stab at whatever's coming out. What are you going to do? So is the door opening or the dirt around it? There's a hole opening up right right around the door. I prepare my sword. Okay. You see a large worm-like monster stick its head out of a hole under the door. Okay, it has worry. eight long tentacles in a circle around its mouth. It doesn't come all the way out, just far enough to attack you. You'll need the following details about the monster. Copy them onto your adventure record sheet. So this is called a carrion crawler, which your characters wouldn't know. But again, we're sharing here. Armor class, seven. Hit dice, three plus one. We're dead. Move, 120 feet. By the way, this is in feet, not the, the double stuff of... Or 40 feet. Attacks, eight. Wow. Eight attacks. Damage, paralysis. Save as a fighter level 2, morale 9, hit points 10, alignment neutral, experience point value 75. Morale, for those you know, don't know, is if they fail a morale roll, they run away. Mm -hmm. But only if the DM has decided there's something happening. You never roll morale if you're winning. <laughs> if the monster is put to sleep by a sleep spell, read number 2. If the monster is killed, read number 3. The carrying crawler will use all 8 of its tentacles to attack the single victim you have chosen. Tell that player to roll 1d6 for initiative, while you roll 1d6 for the monster. Right. Five! I need my dice. Here you go. Thank you. Cool, I got a one. <laughs> <laughs> my luck holds. I cut off all its tentacles. <laughs> one um, if you roll as higher, make eight hit rolls for the carrying crawler. If the player's roll is higher, allow the party to move or attack first. Thank goodness. Be aware of the actions of the other characters, but do not allow any of them to attack in the first round unless they are next to the victim. If any missile fire attacks are desired, tell the players you must move around for a clear shot to avoid hitting your friends. You may fire next round. If any of the carrying crawler's attacks hit, the character must make a saving throw versus paralysis, one per hit, or be paralyzed. 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 <laughs> if any saving throw has failed, tell the victim you fall over. Tell the rest of the players what they see the victim fall, but do not say whether the character is alive or dead. After the first round of combat, ask each player for actions for the coming round. If the first victim is paralyzed, the monster will attack the next closest character. If no characters are nearby, it will crawl out of its hole and attack the nearest. If more than one character moves in to attack the monster, the eight attacks will be divided among the two closest opponents. Damn. That's brutal. I mean, carrying crawler... 
first level characters yep. Yep. that whoa. Yep. Yep. Does it, so does it do damage or is it just paralyzes? Paralyzes. Okay. But once you're unconscious, it eats you. Yeah. Ah. Uh, anyone hit must make a saving throw or fall over paralyzed. Continue running the battle as long as necessary. The party should be able to kill the carrying crawler fairly easily. Any paralyzed characters will recover in three turns, a half hour, unharmed. The party may wait in the outer ruins of this area while their friends are recovering, or may drag them out to the edge of the fields, an even safer move. Whichever they choose, be sure to keep track of the passage of game time, counting the battle as one full turn. All right, so go ahead and swing away. Um, your strength bonus, you get a plus, plus two. two. Yep. You need a I need a 12, so 10. I miss, I die. <laughs> or actually, no, it, it says, uh, let's see. Well, wait a minute, we should know what the armor class is. It's seven. Armor class seven. So we need a 12 that I already hit. We miss. I miss. Ooh, I also miss. <laughs> you need a, well, if you have plus two adjustment, you need a nine or higher to hit. It's normally 11, but if you got a plus 2 bonus, you need a 9 or higher. Well, no. Nope. Look at that. I got a nat 20 when I wasn't rolling. <laughs> okay, you both missed? Yep. All right. It attacks you. We have to make that save. D20, please. Four times. No. That, that D20 doesn't like me, so you can have it. Its first attack is all 8. I thought if there were... Okay. Oh, there's only oh, wait. one for all 8 attacks? there's two enemies right Um... Oh yeah, no, yeah. If you move into attack, then it splits the two. You're right. You're right. Only one hit you. You roll a seventeen or higher. Yep. Okay. Only one hit you. Roll save versus paralysis. Okay, so I need to roll a fourteen or higher. Yes, I believe. Correct. Oh, not high enough. Jeez. Okay, I can't even he falls to the ground. Like Thud. No matter what dice I use. And four go after you. One hit. Roll save versus paralysis. Okay, I'm paralyzed. All right, Fun. and then you Game guys over. are both eaten. <laughs> hey, perfect. That's, that's We didn't have much time for anything to die. <laughs> Just walk up to a wall. Oh. What's this? Oh, I'm paralyzed and I'm... So you have the horrific experience of being slowly consumed and watching first him and then you slowly consumed by the carrion eater. Wait, do I, did I get eaten second? What? Did I get eaten first or second? Second. Dang second. It. Went so you had first. to watch me. No! Yes. And then it came and started at your toes. Yes, oh. and slowly inched its way up. While you're <laughs> conscious and watch him. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, it goes through the process of mapping and everything else, yeah, and you get the like, Dead people don't four, map. What? We're supposed to have like four characters in our party. That's what's recommended, yeah. yeah. And it said if you had less than three, if you had less than three players to add some henchmen and stuff to help. Yeah. So, but you get the idea. See how quickly we were able to get into the game to play it? Yeah. And, and you know, it's 8.50. So. That was two hours. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You've I'm, already played one full adventure, did the beginnings of another one, and the beginnings of yet another one as a full GM player session. Okay, my, so comments. We have about ten minutes so we can discuss this. My son wants to talk me into playing Dungeons & Dragons again with him. Uh, I'm debating whether or not to do B1 or to borrow your Menser one. Well, what you do is you do Menser first. Right. Then you do B1, because B1's a much longer adventure. So I, they, they should start B1 as level 2, probably, maybe. Potentially, maybe. or make another character. Or make many characters, because you, you die a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, you die a lot, because it's zero. There's no there's no unconsciousness. It's You hit zero, you're dead. There's no system saving throw. There's no death saves. There's no negative 10. There's no negative con. You hit zero, you're dead. At one hit point, you're alive. At zero, you're dead. The... I need some blank character sheets. Well, and these are very simple character sheets. Yeah. Yeah. Not blank. Okay, I know, but yeah, they're easily available online. Oh yeah, no, I can print them. Yeah. I just I, that was a mental note. I yes. Need blank yes. I uh, yeah, I would I would have him play through the two solo adventures. The second one will take him a little while to play through, and he might die a couple of times. Yeah. Trying to get through it. And forcing him to read would be a good thing. Yep. 
Yep. Hopefully he has the patience for it. It's written at a very easy, accessible level and right. with some fun to it. So that is what a starter kit should be, yes? When you hear me okay. rail about yeah. why doesn't anybody get it, this, Including this is all you need to have a true starter kit. You know, the box, the dice and stuff. But this is it. Follow this template, everybody. Publishers, game designers. It's... This is what you need to do to introduce new play. If you want to bring in new players who have never role played before, and there's nobody there, nobody there in your group has ever role played before, you have to start from scratch. There's nobody to mentor. Use the book to mentor them into the game. Use this solo adventure module approach, and then walk them through GMing. So again, Cthulhu Seventh Edition got the player part right. They got that down, but they didn't do it with the GM part. They make you have to go through, read everything, and and that is going to be less accessible, less inclusive, and uh, adoption is going to be slower. If you want to maximize adoption of a new activity, this is the way to do it. 1983, Frank Messer. Available in PDF on Drive-Thru RPG. Um, and then once you get through the beginner adventure, everything you need to play is in the Rules Cyclopedia, which is available print-on-demand through Drive-Thru RPG. I think it's like 20 bucks. I mean, this whole book is like 20 bucks. I could be yeah. wrong. It might be 30, but it's not that much. The complete system, all you need is in here for years of gameplay. Does that add new character classes? Yeah. It's, well, so what it does is instead of having to flip through all the different books, mm -hmm. it puts them all together in, in one. Because otherwise you have to go through six, eight, ten different books, ten of right. these little ones as you go up to expert uh uh, companion masters and immortals now this doesn't include immortals this is all the way through masters level which is like 35th level right you want 36 level on up you got to either do this or the i the gold box um which is this one yeah which is what i have all of this ah, have all of these nice. in the immortals box and yeah and those those aren't available in print but this gets you all the way up to 35th level this is all you need for a lifetime of adventure now, again, it doesn't have the introductory, um, you know, it walks you through. It explains everything, mapping and calling, and explains all the stats. As far as I know, I mean, let me check that. I haven't really looked through this in depth. Let's see, look through it. Does it does it have a starting adventure anywhere? I haven't really looked. Through what? The, the, the cyclopedia. Cyclopedia, okay. You look through there. I'm looking see through. if I missed it. Maybe, maybe it's in there later, because it's not the beginning. You know, it just jumps right into making a character, which is fine. And yeah, it's got all the classes put together. Cleric, fighter, magic user, thief, dwarf, elf, halfling, druid, mystic. Uh, druid, mystic are optional. Equipment, abilities, movement, encounters, combat, experience. High level player characters. Paths to immortality. I want to know what that says. It says buy the other book. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, oh, there's a problem. What's that? More problems? Um, yeah. Does it have that? Does that have page numbers? No. no. Ooh. What's oh wait, no. There it is. It's really small print between the squigglies at the bottom. Oh middle. yeah, right there. It's really hard to read. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's that's a little hidden, but at least it's there. But I I had to really look for it. Yeah. Okay, I forgot what my page number was. Okay, one point nine. Yeah, that's definitely not dyslexia friendly. Paths to Immortality. Subject will be explained in greater detail in Chapter 15, but you should know, General, after reading, reaching level 26 or greater, a character can attempt to gain immortality. Eternal youth coupled with great power. Um, a dynast, a hero, a paragon, a polymath. High-level player characters. So it actually does cover at least the basics of the immortal stuff. Wow. Um, don't do procedures, ability checks, blah, blah, blah. Transferring characters, monsters, immortals. 219. <laughs> what kind of creature? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a Cyclops mate. <laughs> yeah, but look at how dorky. <laughs> He's... 
Ah! <laughs> He's stupid and brilliant at the same time. That's funny. He's playing intelligence, just none of the wizards. <laughs> right. So immortal spheres of power. Yeah, okay, this has the immortals in it. Immortals in the game, mortal behavior, manifestation in corporeal form, fighting immortals, PCs becoming immortals, prerequisites, finding a sponsor, the four paths when PCs reach immortality. If a character reaches full immortality, they must retire from the play of the game unless the campaign focus changes to follow the immortals and their activities. Only takes place with when two or more PCs have become immortals. Immortal former PCs may reappear in the campaign as a patron and sometimes manipulator of their old friends. <laughs> so that's where you would break into the book. Yeah, the Immortals Adventures. Because there are a bunch of, there's like a half dozen modules for immortals to go adventuring. It's really cool. Um, so some of the pic front pictures are like you're walking through. Here, I'll show you. Let's see. Here it is. Here's your party just character. walking through lava That's like it's fine. nothing. See that? Yeah. <laughs> we swim in the lava. Like lava, lava, smava. <laughs> we don't care about no lava. Okay, so it, it does have a path to become immortal, but it doesn't have the adventuring as an immortal. Uh, so, yeah, unless, you can, unless the adventure's stashed away, I'm still looking through. Treasure, campaigning, campaign tone and goals, running adventures, planes of existence, variant rules, appendices, the D&D game world, AD&D game conversions, record sheets, indices, and this has an index. So it has both a detailed table of contents and a detailed index. And an appendix. And several appendices, yes, but yeah. Um, a more involved character sheet, a, you know, a more complicated character sheet. Also, DM's character cards for 3x5 index, basically, for each PC. Oh, okay. So, it's you know, basically a form of rostering. So, basically, the combination I'd recommend is if you want to introduce people from scratch, you know, get, get the Frank Metzer PDF and print it out or whatever. Just print out the adventure part. Yeah. Just print out the adventure. Then once you've got the hang of that, then you jump into the, the, the full thing. And that's it. That's Drive all you through need. RPG for free. Drive through RPG and get the PDF, no problem. And the PDF is five dollars a book. So ten bucks for the two. Two for ten. This one may be photocopied for personal use and only yep. D and D games. Yep. Only D and Yeah, don't don't be caught things playing sharp I know that book. <laughs> so now you see why I rail again and again when everybody claims you can jump straight in and start playing. Mm -hmm. And then they don't do it. You can't. This is the only and it was nineteen eighty three. How many decades do we have to wait for another company to get it? And it wasn't even like TSR didn't do this again. And Watsi didn't do it again. So it was just Frank Metzer who got it. I mean, your thoughts on this? Are there any problems you see to this approach? Uh, only on in the inaccuracy between one. Yeah, well, there, there, I'm, I'm talking about the approach, not the implementation. Yeah, the approach, I, I like it. I, I, it's. I think every I think every role playing game should have a basic introduction version just like this. As a, when you have a starter kit, like if it has a starter kit, this is how every starter kit should be. And then go into as much complexity as you want. And then layer it in like this. Your thoughts? I don't see why they don't do it. Is it just because they're too lazy? I don't know. It boggles my mind. <laughs> it if, totally boggles my mind why they don't do it. That method is it, it's copyrighted see, see, by that. No, I know. No. That, that, the only thing could be is a patent. It could yeah. be a, a, a utility or design patent, but it's not. So, yeah, I don't know. I, it, it completely perplexes me. Why not. I, I mean, look at how many games I have. I have a lot of freaking games. <laughs> and they, I have not found anybody else. I'm sure somebody else has. But why are the mainstream companies not doing it? They have the resources. I, I don't know. 
no theories as to why nobody does this anymore? Because you've seen all the starter boxes for D&D every, every edition they right. do it. Each one. And they don't do this. I would love if they could answer that question. <laughs> no, yeah. that would be... Because it works, and it makes it so much more inclusive and accessible for a wider audience. Instead, what all these others do is they rely on a mentor. You have to have one person who's already experienced to draw in new players. What I want to see happen again, like it used to be before all the stigma, is parents can go buy a box because they know their kids are interested, give them the box, the kids may only be 10 years old, and they can learn how to play on their own. They don't need their parents' help, they don't need a mentor to help. They give them the present, birthday present, Christmas present, or just, you know, gift. And the kids learn how to play. It's great if the parents want to be involved in that. I, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. But it should be that simple. And clearly they designed this to do that. And I wonder if this has something to do with the stigma. That doesn't make much sense. That you're not having somebody experienced or a parent or somebody mentor them into it. As opposed to letting them figure it out on their own. I mean, I just don't know. I just, it, again, it completely boggles my mind why companies aren't doing this as a matter of course. This should be standard operating procedure. It makes total sense, as far as I can tell, to always do it this way. And I'd, li I'd like to maybe make a tweet about that and say, hey, what, what is your guys' opinion? Why, why yeah. or why are you not doing this? Yeah. I would love to know. Um, and I am working on, uh, I don't know if I've made it public yet or not, the ideal introduction adventure. Have I made that public yet? I don't think so. I'm doing, I'm trying to create a checklist of all the things you need for an introductory adventure to bring people into a new game. who have never role played before. What are all of the variables that an RPG should have? Maybe I've done it on our, I think it's on our RPGSN, actually. RPGSN.net. Go to my own blog postings. Actually. Maybe not. All right, maybe I was writing it in my own brain. <laughs> You were thinking about it really hard. Really hard, yeah. Where did I? I noticed that one copy of your uh, book, yeah. the player's manual, is missing some pages. Is it the middle pages with the character sheets and stuff? Yeah, and the graph paper. Yeah. That's did you take that my... off the phone copy? Is that what no, happened now? No, it's probably, it's probably either in this box here or it fell out over the decades. Mm -hmm. You know, That's probably why I had to get another copy. But between the two, I've got enough. Um, so do you mind if I borrow the men's or copy? The books? Yes. Okay. Remember that Doctor Who is the priority right now because of the upcoming school thing. Oh, uh, I figure if my son's going to be doing the choose, the choose Your Own Adventure part. Can, will he take care of it? Not spill drinks or anything on yes, it? Yes, okay. I, I will, I will okay. enforce that. Because, I mean, I can get used copies, but they're a little pricey. So, I'd be really bummed to have it lost or ruined. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> um, okay. Where did I... I swear I started on a checklist. You won't be buying it again if, if it comes up. Um, it'll come out of my son's allowance. Huh. And that will be his encouragement not to do it. You'll be <laughs> buying a new copy of this. Well, somewhere I'm working on a checklist of the ideal introductory adventure. And I okay. just don't know where I put it. Maybe I put it under research. No? Weird. All right. Oh, well, the objects are wearing, by the way. Yes. Well, <laughs> they are immortals. <laughs> Clothes. It is ages 14 and on up with the Immortals add right, on. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. So I hope everybody found that useful as we did a full walkthrough. We did an introduction. We talked a little bit through 
Masks the New Generation, the superhero role-playing game, which we're going to delve into. We're going to do a full playthrough of that, one or two playthroughs with that. It looks promising. And then, is that is like a modern, I think you end up in the modern world. Well, well yeah, yeah, it's like, okay. Dungeons I think you do end up, I think you end up in Manhattan. Starts in Manhattan. Yeah. Well, because <laughs> it's immortal. It's the planes. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. It's, it was so much fun. So anyway, uh, so we talked about uh, Mass the New Generation, and then we tried to do a playthrough of Numenera the Starter Kit, because they claimed everything you needed was in the box to open it and start playing right away. Those are their words that you could start playing right away. But then it said you need to read everything in the books before you start playing. And it wasn't set up in a way that we could skip in right. and play. So, like all the other starter kits except for 7th edition Cthulhu, you cannot start playing right away. And none of them you can start GMing right away. Except the 1983 Frank Metzer basic D&D Red Box. That is the only one to date that I'm aware of. And I would love for people to just tell me about others. So I can Please point to them. Wrong. At, well, it's not that I've been wrong. I'm sure there must be others that repeated this model. I just don't know them, and I would like to know them. So please do share if you know of others that did the same things in the Frank Messer model uh, to do that detailed step by step process where both play starts right away to learn as a player and GMing starts right away to learn as a GM, and you don't have to read through it all in advance. You can pretty much just jump in and figure it out as you go. I, I, I really have difficulty believing this is they're the only ones that did it. But it's the only ones I've been able to find to date. Right. And I would love for people to point me to others so I can add to that list. Um, and then, you know, developers, please start when you do your starter kits. I'm not talking about for the rest of your games, but for your starter kits, when you know it's going to be introductory, follow this model. Just use it as a direct template and things will be, you'll be able to make it so much more accessible and inclusive for new players. Uh, across the board to be able to start playing themselves and start bringing their friends in together and go hey I started learning to play this you want to play this with me we're gonna have to figure it out together but let's let's try it right and that's 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 exciting so all right well thank you for joining us do you guys have any last comments no nope, just a note that um, it does recommend some additional solo adventures Blizzard Pass and Maze of the Writing Minotaur which we do have yeah. yep those do help you further reinforce um, they're the far left of that stack. Way down here. No, you were the, no, that's it. They're all there. I have all those. And those are the ones with the revealer coder ink. Oh, Or yeah. the, uh, red decoder. Well, the problem with the revealer ink is that once you use it, it's done. Yeah. Um, luckily they started going to a red decoder later and that was reusable. Um, they even have some high level ones. And even Lankmar, they did a, a Lankmar, entire Lankmar campaign in AD&D that use the red decoder. So you can and play Lankmar by yourself as yeah. Fafford and Grey Mauser, which was cool. Um, those didn't fully catch on, but I enjoyed them. You know, it's more fun with a group, but sometimes it's just kind of fun to just do that yourself. Yeah. And it's certainly for learning the mechanics, it, it does help. Um, so tomorrow we are going to be at Spark Central doing our drop-in and RPG, drop in RPG.com. And uh, John, you'll be there, I'll be there, Riley? No, I'm from okay. the I think, what's that? I'm coming on Saturday, though. Okay, good. Uh, I think nobody's going to be there but you and I. I don't think anybody else is coming. I mean, other than players, so we'll have to deal with that. Shane's um, too sick. Danielle can't because of the van convention. Um, Dan can't because of work still. We have to turn people away again. I'm afraid we're going to have to, yeah. I hate that. I'm trying to get these two. So do we keep the up. rowdy ones or the calm ones? It's first come, first serve. It's first come, first serve. Right. So unless unless we can get somebody else to help. But I don't know who else is, you know, Shane was the next closest. Um, Brad is, you know, too busy. Um, you know, Sammy still, whatever he's dealing with, still not being active. Charles is too busy, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, we have so many GMs, but we're just having trouble getting them to to be consistent. Now, on Saturday, um, because of an emergency that happened with, they just lost the DM on their kids' day one. Yeah. And Danielle said she wasn't available until the 16th, so I'm filling in until Danielle can take over on the 16th. So you're not coming on the Saturday either? Right. Okay. 
So Shane's going to try to GM the Saturday workshop if he's well enough. He'll let me know tomorrow um, for the GM workshop from 9 a.m. to noon. Yep. Um, he's going to have to do last mine. If he's doing last mine's of Van Gallagher on Saturday. Mine. Mine. Then he's going to have to do it without my toys. Well, he's not doing last mine. I thought he was doing um, Dragon Hunt. I don't know what he's doing anymore. Yeah, I think okay. he was talking about Dragon Heist. I don't know. I've lost track. I hope He'll be doing whatever he's doing. Oh, no, wait a minute. I do remember what he's, he's doing. He's doing the one that you did. He's he's doing the one that... Yeah. Um, okay. Lunch in Waterdeep. Yeah. Okay. So he, he's, he should be good for that. Okay. Well, again, if he's up to it. Um, okay. Well, there we are, folks. Thank you. If you're not a donor yet, please swing by rpgresearch.com forward slash donate. You have half a dozen different ways. Well... Four or five different ways to donate, or you can go to patreon.com forward slash RPG Research and become a Patreon supporter and get early access to all kinds of goodies, including some brand new uh, blog postings and essays that are coming from our assistant researchers. And uh, one of them's on bleed in gaming, and we have others coming very soon in the pipe, and they're going to our Patreon supporters first, and then about a month or so later, they'll be available to the general public. But, but as a thank you to our Patreon supporters, that's where they show up first. Brand new research articles from our multiple researchers. But thank you, wherever you may be, be well, happy gaming, and namadier. Dream well. Peace out.